Hello, and welcome to episode 145 of Flicks and a Six. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Costanzo, with me forever and always, the man, the myth, the Mitch and Murray yeast, Alessandro Bailsi. <laughs> Say hello, Al. Are there any things other than gall or disaster that can be unmitigated? Huh. No. You know, you don't have unmitigated successes. You don't have... <laughs> You don't have, but you do have unmitigated disasters. That's right. That's right. On this week's episode, Disney release dates, going back to theaters, and shits, sweeps, and other news and nuggets, all before diving into our flick of the week, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. But first, Al, what are we drinking? I like that. I see what you're doing right there. Ah, I see it. Uh, so we're drinking the Tom Green beer, not the Green Tom beer. It's so good. <laughs> So good. I uh, just before the show, I was blown away because I was obviously I said that when he when it's when he said it out loud, the Tom Green beer. I got excited and I said, "Not the Green Tom beer." And then found that at the end of the Tom Green beer, there's an asterisk, and then that asterisk is corresponding note on the bottom right of the beer says, "Not the Green Tom beer," which is absolute <laughs> perfection. <laughs> so I want to tell a little anecdote about how we came to do this beer. Um, We had had this plan for an episode a couple of months ago. I don't remember which episode. I know that for some reason I was excited to have that beer on that episode. And Anthony forgot that he had the Tom Green beer, not the Green Tom beer. I think it was Face Off. Yes, maybe you're right. right. And he forgot to put it in his fridge, so we didn't do it. That is correct. (laughs) So what happens is most of the time for this, I mean, we have occasional one or two beers that are exchanged. But what happens is once every three years... I go and buy all the beer. and <laughs> All of it. <laughs> now, once every few months, I go to the beer store and I buy a bunch of beer for mm. me and Anthony. Um, it seems particularly prescient during this time because we, you know, we had a pact once, like a long time ago, that we would see each other monthly. And right. for a couple of years, I think we probably averaged seeing each other like 14 times a year. So, success. Yeah. We fell off that pace a little bit. I hang on. I kind of like that idea of actually of adding the times within the year because there's months where you go without seeing each other. But if you bring the months like October in where you see each other a few times, but we, like, I like that, that. that first like two years, I think we did a pretty good job. And like, sure, even if we did end up missing the month, like it would be like six weeks. That's right. And then we'd see each other two weeks later. So like it averaged out. Yeah, perfectly. Um, to like I said, even probably slightly more than monthly um we fell off that pace a little bit but still we're keeping it to like nine or ten times a year at least yeah um or at least nine or ten months of the year i'll say because we probably still kept it to roughly Uh, the average of monthly because like we would see each other for like the christmas party and new year's and like those are ten days apart Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh but anyway uh i bought a ton of beer so that i could give it to anthony and we could do the show, and we'd have all the same beers, because early on in this show's run, uh, we used to both go to the beer store and try and see if we could find the same beers, and we'd be lucky and to fail find miserably. three after, like, 45 minutes in the store. Yep. yep. <laughs> so I was walking Not a lot store. of overlap. <laughs> no. Surprisingly. Um, or unsurprisingly, considering we've done 100 and something unique beers um, mm. across, I don't know, 50 breweries or so? Well, at least 145 unique beers. Well, yeah. Um, that's true. Definitely more. It's definitely more. See yeah. uh, <laughs> Cloud Atlas Part 1. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's the second time already in the last 20 minutes that that episode's come, out, <laughs> come up in our conversation. La, 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 la. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to start whistling the wrong song at the same time. <laughs> uh, so I usually go to the store. They have a make your own six pack thing. I usually read that and make us. You know, two, three, four, six packs of beers. Some of those end up being the ones that are kind of expired. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I go see if there's anything else that I, I'd like to, to pick up. And I spend way too much money at the beer store. But as I was walking through the store, just seeing what's there for the show's interests or for my interests, a face caught me out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> <laughs> and I backtracked slightly and looked at the bottle on the shelf because it was literally at eye level. Awesome. And I was you like, know all about that. <laughs> and, like, I'm going to show you, like, the thing. Like, you know, this is, you can see the name here, right? So it was turned right. like this. Mm-hmm. And I was like, is that Tom Green? <laughs> I mean, it is. It's perfect. And I walked up closer, and then I could see along the side of the label, it says the Tom Green beer. I was like, 
oh my god, that is Tom Green. <laughs> Which is funny because I didn't watch the Tom Green show. I sure. vaguely remember him in... Was he in The Pest? Was that the one he was in? No. What movie was he in? He was in a movie around that Charlie's time. Angel. He was in Charlie's Angel. <laughs> <laughs> there was a scene where he was on a boat, wasn't there? That was Charlie's Angels, yes. So you can understand why I went with The Pest. <laughs> I do understand. <laughs> <laughs> The um, Chad. I think that's what his name was in Charlie's oh, Angels. Oh, yeah, the Chad. <laughs> that was it, right? Long time since I've seen that. Yeah. Anyway, I was like, wow, this is such a late 90s, early 2000s thing that Anthony is going to love because he was even more attuned to what was going on in the world at that time than I was, especially in the world of pop culture. And so here we are, the Tom Green beer. Oh, man, I from... forgot. What's there up? was also, I forgot he was in Road Trip. Yes, that I remember. That's a fun one. I've enjoyed that movie. Stealing Harvard, Road Trip, Freddy Got Fingered, Charlie's Angels. I didn't see those other ones. No. Um, so this was brewed by Bose All Natural Brewing Company from Van Cleek Hill in Ontario, Canada. Imported by Remarkable Liquids. <laughs> <laughs> I normally don't say who imports it, but I just like the name of that company. Of course. Yeah. From, from Gilderland Center, New York. <laughs> Remarkable Liquids. <laughs> <laughs> Ingredients? <laughs> These liquids are a (laughs) mock. They are. (laughs) Ingredients. Local spring water. Hmm. Organic barley malts. Organic oats. Organic lactose. Organic hops. Brewer's yeast. All right. Oddly vague after how specific those other things were. (laughs) 5% alcohol by volume. It's beer. 1.4 fluid ounces. This is a milk stout. (sighs) Um... Package date, October 21st, 2016. Yeah, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> it's quite effervescent for being that old. <laughs> like I said, sometimes uh, they're a little expired. It's the borderline four-year anniversary. <laughs> it is approaching four years old. <laughs> Great. Uh, I will say that if you look at, I don't know what the top of yours looks like, but the bubbles are doing just this wonderful dance through the foam. It's really nice. It's because it's old. It's very... <laughs> yeah, it's because it's old. It's uh, almost hypnotic. It's pretty cool. Um, shall we give this a try? I, I mean, <laughs> let's see how, we la- how long we last. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. This is the final episode of Flicks and a <laughs> I timed it just perfectly that Anthony almost you died. You did. <laughs> All right. It, um... It's not bad. It doesn't have a lot of flavor, and I think that... <laughs> uh, I don't agree. It almost tastes like... um, It almost tastes watered down to me. It definitely tastes like a port with... This was a porter set. Sorry, a stout with oats in it. What I will say is I don't taste the lactose component, but I'm okay with that because I'm not a huge fan of that. I I actually get that and I like that I I have that like the mouthfeel that I feel like those lactose infused beers have. Well, I actually attributed the mouthfeel to the oats because mm. for me uh, the lactose tends to sit on my palate and I feel like I just drank milk. That's what it. That's what this tastes like to me. It feels like to me. I don't I don't like that experience. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I did this one because I know I do, and I, it's I know a weird you thing do. to say. <laughs> I know you do because the confluence of Tom Green and Milk Stout is why I got this. Because sure, I know you enjoy it. I don't because you're a big fan of, or was it who was it in way back in the the top five beers? Was it you or Brian who put the Nitro Left Hand? Uh, that was me. I'm pretty that sure. Was I remember that you like that style. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's tasty. I actually I do like this. Um. I do feel like it's not fresh. I don't know. I mean, it tastes like beer to me. It doesn't taste. It does. It 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 tastes. It it does taste. Uh, it tastes like it's a little bit lacking. It tastes like it's been sitting around for is a minute. Is it dusty? Is that what it is? It tastes a little dusty. <laughs> it's got a little lactosey, dusty mouthfeel. <laughs> hey, here's a here's a complete tangent for you. We went out to dinner to Maloney's down the block from me. Okay, uh, is that which that place I believe. To, I, I think I was gonna say I think I took you there. They have like over a hundred beers on tap. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. 
So got a few beers there. It was quite quite delightful because they have, their their beer list is huge. It's two sides of a sheet of paper and it's broken up into sections. So you, you like you want IPAs, you go here. You want sours, which they have a lot of, you go here. Like and they have little sections that you can go into. Um, the only problem can- with those sorts of places is I end up getting the I'm like okay, there's a hundred beers there, and then the one beer that I want the most always ends up we don't have being that. I'm like there I get so mad even though there's 99 other beers for me to try. Yeah. Yeah, they're, but they are, I will say, I'll give them a little bit of credit there. They're pretty on top of crossing it out before giving you the menu. Yes. Which I appreciate. But I always, the, the problem is the X always draws my eye, and I'm like, oh. oh. okay. Got, gotcha. <laughs> I, I mean, there's been more, more than one occasion where I'm like, can I have this one? And they're like, I'm sorry. And then they go to get me the next one that I asked for, and they're like, this is embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I swear it never happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I went, we went there, and uh, Kim loved sours, and uh, she was having a couple beers that night, too. She got a couple, one that she really liked, and we were going through the list of some of the other ones, trying to pick another one, asking the uh, the waiter for his recommendations and whatnot. And she's like, I got to ask about this one. <laughs> she's like, it says horse blanket? <laughs> is, that a, is that a flavor profile that you want? <laughs> and so we looked it up, and like, that's a legit thing that has been used to describe the flavor of, the flavor profile of some beers. More that's often than not, Wet horse blanket. <laughs> yeah, until you just said that, I forgot that that's a thing, but it is absolutely a thing. Mm-hmm. So we were like, she, she, she was asking him about that. She's like, is it, he's like, she's like, is that right? And he's like, yeah. He's like, it's just how they describe the mouthfeel of that one. Um, and a little bit of the, of the, of the forward flavor on it. And he goes, it's a, he's like, it's a really good one. <laughs> she's like, all right. So we got that and one other one. And I, mean, I took Kim, a sip Kim of it. horses. So I feel like Exactly. Exactly. So we got that one. I took a sip of it. I was like, I see what you're saying. <laughs> I'm a little bit more thrown off that I'm not appalled. <laughs> I feel like I should but, uh, eat this, but I, I don't. Right. It feels like I should be disgusted right now. <laughs> Definitely taste the horse. <laughs> <laughs> it's made with authentic bits of horse. <laughs> yeah. Horse blanket. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry Peanut. That's right. That's right. Uh, how many, uh, what are we giving this guy over here? Uh, probably one to two thuckles. I was going to give it a thuckle. I was going to give it a thuckle. I think it might be pushed over into two thuckles, provided it were fresh. <laughs> I have to it's, say, got, it's got a little bit of a, my bum is on the beer <laughs> <laughs> flavor. <laughs> Swedish. Sweet, <laughs> Swedish. <laughs> wow, there's a thing that I thought that uh, that that never crossed my mind as potentially coming back into the forefront. <laughs> well, you didn't expect to drink the Tom Green beer. That's true. That's true. He is looking awfully dapper on the front of this yeah, he's got beer bottle. Like sweater vest over like a gingham like button down shirt. What was odd was the day that you gave it to me, or like was like a day or two after I had just listened to him on Justin Long's podcast. Oh, really? And I just I was like, "What is the timing of this? <laughs> and ha- why is this happening?" <laughs> it's that's the God. We always, I always yeah, I know. It's that thing. It's remember. that word that we don't remember. Yeah, I wanted to call it Dunning Kruger effect, but that's not it. That's the wrong. The Diane Kruger effect? <laughs> no, Dunning Kruger. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, this is the Diane Kruger effect. <laughs> <laughs> Can we call it that from now on? Just <laughs> we're gonna coin a new term. The Diane <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh man, that's going, um, that's going in the show notes. Uh, I can't wait until something like this happens on an episode when we have a guest and we call it that and convince them that that's really what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> and that let's get into some news and nuggets. <laughs> God. Uh, what um, what's going on with these Disney releases though? <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> How do you like that transition? Yeah. Uh, Boom. Let's do a quick reading here. Disney postpones Black Widow, Shang-Chi, Eternals, and many more films. Uh, this is on IGN. This was, I believe, today. Yes. This, okay. This evening, or at least the last update was. Disney has pushed nearly all of its 2020 film releases to 2021. The release date changes affect the first wave of openings for films in Phase 4 of the, God, that was annoying, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe including the expected delay of Black Widow from November to next May. Black Widow's new May 7th, 2021 date is almost exactly a year after its original May 1st, 2020 release date, 
Hang on. When, when did this article come out? Today. Posted, Is this... Posted today at one fifteen. updated at 6.36. Really? That's very odd. Go on. Go on. Keep going. The COVID-19 pandemic first prompted Disney to push Black Widow to November 6th, and, well, here we are. It was reported in March via an unnamed Marvel insider that, quote, pushing Black Widow affects nothing on the MCU timeline. Here's the full list of Disney release, release dates changed. Death on the Nile, previously dated 10-23-20, moves to 12-18-20. Optimistic. The Empty Man, previously dated on 12-4-20, moves to 10-23-20. That's also odd. Both, both Death on the Nile and Black Widow are still listed as their original release dates, which is interesting. Yeah, I think until November, it actually, November until 6th actually, and October. Uh, probably until it actually screens, it won't change, would be my guess. Oh, you're looking on IMDb. No, I'm just Googling around. And the only reason why I'm doing this is that I, well, this time, this dovetails very nicely into one of my topics, which was I went to go, I went to the movies and, um, the, these two movies were they the new trailers for them played with the release dates that you just said that that got pushed. Well, that's because those shipped probably with that movie however long ago, a week or two ago. That's fair. That's uh, crazy though. Like that's they just they, I mean it makes sense that they're moving them again, but yeah, Black Widow we got to is moving to May seventh of next year. Eternals previously dated on twelve twelve or sorry two twelve twenty one moves to. Uh, November 5th, 2021. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, previously dated on 5 7 21, moves to 7 9 21. This is where it gets fun. Oh boy. Untitled Disney event film. <laughs> previously dated. You can't delay something that's not announced. Just don't say anything. <laughs> no, no, no. It's been announced, just not titled. <laughs> Previous... Yes, yes, the Diane Kruger event. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, this is a different effect. <laughs> it's not Diane Kruger. This is something else. We're going to have to come up with another Kruger. <laughs> Freddy? <laughs> there you go. This is the Freddy Kruger effect. <laughs> Previously dated on 7 9 21 is removed from the schedule. Deep Water. What? Oh, hang on. <laughs> Untitled has been removed? <laughs> uh, yeah, Untitled has become... I don't know. Un Unreleasable. <laughs> un unincorporated? <laughs> Oh my god, alright. So, Sorry, I was thinking of that, tragic. I was thinking of that, that stupid line from, uh, there was an episode of Parks and Rec in which they were, remember there was a whole season where the storyline was the merger of Pawnee and Eagleton? Mm -hmm. And she, like, collects a council of, like, city councilmen and women who worked in other towns who went through mergers, and there's this creepy old man who says, oh, you know, you think it's gonna go all nice and easy, but if it doesn't work out on, on the timeline you expect to, you know, not only will the merger not work out, but the whole area might become unincorporated territory. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> oh man, I love that show. All right, go on, go on. Deep, deep water, which I have no idea what that is. Previously dated on eleven thirteen twenty, moves to eight thirteen twenty one. Untitled twentieth century. That's just what it's called. Previously dated on eight thirteen twenty one is removed from the schedule. West Side Story, which I didn't know existed until I read this article, moves from 12-18-20 to 12-10-21. I actually, I had seen a trailer for that like a hundred years ago. <laughs> didn't know there was a trailer. Uh, there is a little bit more on that in a minute, though. The King's okay. Man, previously dated on mm. 2 26 mm -hmm. 21 moves actually up two weeks to 2 12 21. Disney's got a lot of stuff. Well, because half of this release was Fox Films, so. Oh, that's right. With their thumbs and a lot of pies. Yes. That's a thing, right? Weird experience. <laughs> um, I want to see The King's Man. Yeah. I, I keep forgetting that's a thing. I don't remember what two dates you just mentioned for it, but either way, I'm upset that it's moved. <laughs> they were, well, this one actually moved up in February, but I'm pretty sure it was supposed to come out this past February. That sounds right. Um, Steven Spielberg's remake of West Side Story has also been pushed almost exactly a year from a holiday 2020 to a holiday 2021 slot. Disney didn't explain why it's keeping the Ryan Reynolds video game action comedy Free Guy, which I also forgot existed. Yeah. And Pixar's Soul on their late 2020 release schedule. 
Hmm. There had been speculation that Soul might be shifted to Disney Plus instead of Yes, Disney Plus. I think oh, Free Guy will. <laughs> what's that? I feel like Free Guy would be moved to Disney Plus as well. Yeah, and the early release of Pixar's Onward on the streaming service. Okay. Um, at the bottom of this article, there is a quiz. Us. Ooh, what is it? Was this article informative? Yes or no? Oh. Um, in, not real. I guess you, gave me, you gave me random facts. I guess so. But <laughs> there's a lot of whys <laughs> and more questions. I'm more interested in what is untitled movie that did that got moved. What is untitled movie that got removed? <laughs> uh, it's actually untitled event film. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what is an event film? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Is that like maybe something they do like in the park? What I want to know is, is the film about a particular event or are we all supposed to get super hyped because viewing the film will be eventful? I, I was, my mind didn't even go to the former. So I was <laughs> assuming the latter. Um, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> That's just a subgenre of Disney movies. Movies about shit that happened. <laughs> There's not even like it was untitled Disney like historical like, documentary or something like that. Like, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> All right. So a lot of things moved recently. I guess is that a? I wonder is that like a reception to, um. Ticket sales for theater openings? Is it just a smart move in general because the world's not going to be back to normal? Like, well, because considering a bunch of theaters started opening in earnest just a couple of weeks ago, I'm assuming that this is in response to that's like, what I would, lackluster box office. That's what I would think as well. I, I understand why these businesses wanted to open. I understand why the studios want them to open. I also very much understand why people are not comfortable going to see movies right now because oh, yeah. I am one of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I um, It's funny. It's like a, it, when you think about the stuff, it's like, oh, there's going to be a, ser- a point in time where like there's going to be a, the lull and you're not going to be able to see anything new. And they actually reversed that. The lull is just happening now while we can't go. And they're stockpiling all the movies that were going to be released. And then while those are being released, they'll make other movies and there won't be a feature gap. Theoretically, <laughs> you know, the second that we have real honest to God rollout of a vaccine, these movie studios are just going to face fuck us with movies. Like, oh, it's yeah. going to be every day, every <laughs> yeah. day, a new movie is coming out. And I am welcoming it. <laughs> You're going to be walking down the street and someone is going to come around a corner and hit you with a sledgehammer in the face that has a movie attached to it. Yep. hundred uh, percent. I will say my movie going experience was quite pleasant. Um, I good. believe there were one, two, four, eight, ten. There were like, there were like twelve people in the theater, uh, like very, like very far apart. The thing is, I probably could do it. Mm-hmm. I just already spend so much time in public that mm-hmm. it just seems like an unnecessary risk. Hundred percent tag on top of that. Yeah. I agree with that. That's that's totally fair. For me, it was more like I um, I was itching a couple of to go. A couple of friends wanted to see Tenet, and um, I was just like, I was I was hesitant when we first brought when they first brought it up, like a few t- like for a little bit, and then like when it came up again, I was like, just like let's just do it, you know. And well, if, it, only, like, if only like twelve or thirteen fine. people like were going, you guys probably could have gotten that sort of size group and just got the whole theater. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um yeah, cuz that's actually, that actually I think is pretty cool. So it's like for a new movie it's 150 bucks to rent the theater and for uh the older movies that are op- that uh, that you have the option of there it's 100 bucks, which is pretty sweet and you can do up to 20 people. Oh, that, that's actually a pretty good deal. Yeah, both of them are good. If you get the 20 people, you're either way you're paying less than a movie ticket. Yeah. Which is awesome. Um but even so, it's like it's almost borderline. I kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll just pay that just, <laughs> just, just for me. <laughs> You're gonna pay a hundred dollars just to buy the the screen yeah. for yourself. One, one seat. You, you, one, one. I would like to, one. I would like you to play the eighty nine Batman, please. Uh, how many people will be coming? Just the one. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll let you know what chair I'm in. You can clean. Yeah. It. <laughs> but uh, no, so, the, I feel like that would work. I mean, even just you, you me, and Kim could go split that for. Mm-hmm. For sure, I will say um, it was. Uh, I'm I'm very glad I got to see it. Um, 
my hot my hot take for you because I didn't give you a review yet. No, but uh, I will give you a. I actually forgot you were doing that. So an, a non non spoilery review. I gave this to a couple of work friends. Is that it's uh gave it an eight out of ten. It is very convoluted, even for a Christopher Nolan movie. Wow! But it's very entertaining if you could stick with it. Hey, it's listen, a, very it's entertaining a wild ride. and eight out of ten and worth your time is is. Listen, not everyone can be the best. Like some of them I, have to be something below the best. Only one I of think, them can be the best. And that's right. But I do think that the, word, <laughs> the the saddest part about the whole thing was when Kim turned to me at the end and said, "I didn't understand a single thing that just happened, and I tried. I tried so hard." <laughs> <laughs> well, so the worst part about that sort of thing too is like maybe that's why home viewing is just like eventually going to fully like annihilate like the box like. You can watch a movie with someone who, like, normally wouldn't want to go see that movie, per se. And, like, if they don't understand, you can pause and talk it out. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, because I know I've done that with people watching stuff. Like, when I've watched, like, something like Cloud Atlas with someone for the first yeah. time. Like, hey, you got any questions? Let's pause it. Let's hash it out. Because, like, it's very dense and convoluted to get on the front end if you're not super invested in it. So, right. Like, that can be hard. And sometimes, as you talk it out, you realize you kind of fuck something up, and it makes your yeah. understanding of it better as well. It was one of those things where, like, going through it, I was like... Going through the movie, I was like, I like you're not wrong. Like, I was I was confused for a large portion of it. Granted, I had a, a handful of things that I was prepared to piece together, but they were just theories until other pieces interlocked, which, okay. is, which is fun. And then that they eventually kind of worked out work themselves out and I, I at the end I strung it together. Um it's not as crazy as it seems. Um it's the the, the mechanics of the movie, because he likes to introduce interesting mechanics in his movie, those are impossible to wrap your head around. <laughs> they are mind bendy. But um it's uh it's fun. It's a very it was entertaining. Good. There was a point towards the end of the movie where I went, ah and Kim goes, I I don't I don't what? <laughs> I'm excited to see it a year from now. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll rent the theater. Um, but anyway, it was it was fun to go back. But uh, in going back, I got to see some trailers. You know how I like my uh, my trailers. Uh, no commercials. I appreciated that. Oh, nice. Just trailers. I would have thought so, there would be more commercials. I know. So we got the uh, we got the the latest Wonder Woman trailer, which you already know that I'm not a fan of. Um, <laughs> give me the old one first. Uh, got a Bond trailer that I didn't see. I liked that. Uh, that was good. You didn't that, see all of the Bond trailers? I think I've seen I, no, I did. I did not. Um, it was it was fun. Nothing. Oh, I mean, fun in that it was doing Bondy things with the dun dun, you know, like the music, like the the good stuff. But no, nothing like remotely close to anything story related came through in that trailer. <laughs> I was like, this is just James Bond doing. This is an advertisement to the opening of the GoldenEye video game, not the movie. The video game. <laughs> that's how, that's what it felt like. So Let's just fuck that around was with fun Bond, the, with some James Bond stuff. Like you know? yeah. There was a, a new Black Widow trailer, which actually got me more excited for the movie. Actually, I was more entertained. I felt like there was more, like more to be done there, and I I was worried in the previous trailers because I didn't know what was going on. I, and then I keep getting reminded that Marvel doesn't generally screw, or Disney doesn't generally screw these things up. So I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, so that definitely looked better. And then I saw the Death on the Nile trailer, and I was like. Oh yeah, I forgot this was coming out. <laughs> I got really excited about it. I keep remembering it's coming out, but I keep feeling like it's two years away. Oh, well, you're not wrong. <laughs> no, but like even before the moving back of the thing, like sure, like like that's just that presupposes that they've basically finished the movie or finished the majority of the right. movie. Like there's a oh, trailer. Oh, the movie's like, done. I keep feeling like we haven't got the first trailer yet, even though I'm yeah. 99 percent sure I've seen it. Yeah, I, yeah, it was it was it was a good one. Um, it was it was good enough. Like it, it did that thing, that fun thing of hyping up the character because the uh, the detective you know from the previous movie. So they did like a they, they did that cool thing where they like kind of keep him in the dark until like the last scene where they show you the detective, so that if you haven't pieced it together now you do if you're familiar with the previous movie. And I was like, oh, like, there he is, and, and he introduces himself, and you're like, oh, he's doing his thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. Um, but yeah, so it was it was pretty sweet to uh to see a fresh movie on the big screen. Again, I was uh, I felt at home. And it wasn't uncomfortable. So there was that. That's good. Yeah. How was it getting in and out of the theater? Nobody. There was nobody there. It was uh, there, there were people there was a couple of people behind the counter 
I got my popcorn. Popcorn w- prices were cut in half or something. I don't know. It was like four dollars for all of the popcorn. <laughs> I just wheel that machine. In yeah, <laughs> but I feel like that's what happened. They were like, well, we can only make it in batches of a, of gallons of like a tanker. So we have to get rid of it every time we make it. So here's all of our popcorn. Uh, so that was fine. There was, yeah, there was no, there were no customers walking around because there were so few people going. But um, it was pretty sweet. So moving on. So we got some Disney pushback. We, I saw a movie in theaters. That was fun. Tell me about WandaVision. Whew. You first. Yeah, so that trailer came on and... I was like, oh, it's this thing. So you had that came... trailer in Tenet, you said? Uh, this was on... No, I, I think I saw this on TV. I think I saw this oh, during okay. the Emmys. Um, I was like, oh, I, this is that thing that I've heard about <laughs> that's coming out. And I was watching, I was like, oh, this is weird. Is this whole thing going to be like a like a goofy, like, I love Lucy, but um, Marvel characters? Like, that could be a fun shtick. I don't think it'll last very long. And then weird things started to happen. I was like, um... I don't know what this is. <laughs> and then it ended. And I was asked, what was that? And I was like, uh, it's not clear. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's pretty consistent with whatever little, like, what did we see a teaser like a year ago for this or something like that? Cause like, it's not the first time I've seen them dressed up in 1950s stuff, like on screen. So like th- we did get some sort of teaser a while back, didn't we? I think so. So I wouldn't say that any of this was particularly surprising, except for what's her name being in it, Catherine Hahn being in it. That was a surprise to me. I didn't expect to see her in a in a superhero thing. Mm. Um, and she seems to be breaking not well, not the fourth wall, but she's like breaking that illusion. Like she knows that she's in that thing and in that what's going on. Yeah, so I, I wonder if she's got to be some sort of otherworldly presence. Me, oh, maybe an internal of some kind. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, who knows? I have honestly, like, if you if you got anything out of that, you must be familiar with some sort of source material that I am not, because there was there was nothing of substance there, just confusion. Well, the bit I'd heard when this was first announced, well, first thing I heard when it was announced was what the fuck sort of title is that, and I concur. Mm. <clears throat> um, it's just so clunky oh yeah very and i get that it's like a play on words and it does have like double meanings and that's great and all but (laughs) but as as the title of your thing yeah yeah it seems like it it feels like something that should be part of like a one-off joke in the show not right right like one like one episode in your in your annoyingly 22 episode season that has a lot of random filler in your walking dead season A single episode dedicated to nonsense. <laughs> no, no, no. Just like the like the title feels like the type of thing that you'd make a joke in the mm. show, not the name of the show. But anyway, um, from what I understand, based on other people's familiarity with, it, I guess there must have been something in the run of the show. It's basically she goes nuts after Vision dies and tries to create an alternate universe where he is not dead. Oh. Oh, okay. That's super dark, and I don't think I'm prepared for that. <laughs> yeah, well, and it makes sense, right? Because she... Oh, it makes well, sense. I've never got a full, really, accounting of what her powers actually are, but we know she can do things to play my... Mm-hmm. You and me, and so maybe she can do herself in her... Sure. Like an Inception thing. Well, like the Cobb's thing, right? Where he, yeah. you know, lives in that, wallows in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's whatever. I mean, I'm going to watch it. Like, who, who are you kidding? I'm obviously going to check it out. Sure. I just, yeah. No, I mean, like, it was interesting. There was some... I got to do something with this Disney Plus subscription. <laughs> there was definitely, like, beyond, like, just the surreal thing of seeing them in the 1950s, like, just, like, the, the actual tone of some of the scenes and, like, the, like, that they were setting up and, like, the dialogue was, like, okay, like, this is going to be absurd, Right. In hopefully the best sort of way, but it's hopefully. the type of thing where it's like even if it's a swing and a miss, it could be unintentionally entertaining. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. Um, but we'll see. Again, I I keep questioning things, but they haven't let me down yet. You know, I'm not really questioning it. Uh, it's not like anywhere near my top ten list of things I'm most excited for. But like when it comes out, I'm gonna watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I definitely am intrigued to see what it's all about. So, um, we're going to move on to something that we've watched before getting to what we're watching. 
something that we've watched that sweeped seven out of their seven Emmy nominations. And goddamn was I excited for all of that. Schitt's Creek took actor, actress, supporting actor, supporting actress, writer, director, and best comedy. Damn. <laughs> that was awesome. And uh, was so well deserved. <laughs> I absolutely adore that show. And I'm so glad that they got all that credit. Yeah, I obviously love the show as well. We did a lot of talk about that over the last couple of years, the last year mm-hmm. plus. Um, it's great to see them all rewarded. I'm a little surprised that they swept. I know some people were a little bit, and there was some hand-wringing. There was some rationalizing. I don't think it has to be that big of a deal. I do think it probably was more of a lifetime achievement award for like the lifetime of the show in some regards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause it, uh, because of the lack of recognition prior. Yeah. Cause you see mm-hmm. that happen sometimes where a show runs for however many years and they always get kind of pushed off to the side. It's like, they're always the bridesmaid and never the bride. And it's like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it was like a super like deep, the comedy like categories didn't seem super deep this year. Like a, I mean, I like obviously I love what we do in the shadows, and that sure was nominated and that deserved nominated in one category three times. <laughs> it's like, damn, was it? I forgot. Was, yeah, was, I think it was uh, writing. It got three different writing nominees. You didn't finish the second season yet, right? No. So no. Okay. well, because that's what it's for is the second and season. And the one that you were the episode that you love, I'm pretty sure was one of the writing. Oh, ones. of course it was the yeah. Jackie Daytona one. I, I believe oh, so. God, it's so good. Uh, um i I know like some people were a little bit miffed that like the good place didn't get it and like that ended as well so it was a little surprised it didn't get well so there's i think there's something to be said there where yes it ended no you don't deserve an award for your for it being your final season when you put final seasons there were three shows that were up in their final seasons someone's gonna Um, go home empty-handed and I mean, I I watched two of the three. The one that won was far better. Okay, interesting. I, I know that opinion. I know that the good place was had both a big fan culture around it and was critical. The good the good place I loved it. The third season was probably or the last final season. I don't remember what, what number it was. It was probably the weakest of. Oh, okay. But I still really enjoyed it. But that being said, the final season of Shit's Creek was fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> and very emotional. Yes. <laughs> oh, and I recently so the the Schitt's Creek Instagram account is great. And they they do they put out some great stuff. But uh one thing was a a screen grab of a tweet from Mariah Carey. I believe it was a tweet. M- mentioning Dan Levy will always be her David Rose and in the in their comment on it said someone please go check on Dan. <laughs> 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 Which is just really tremendous. But uh, they were just all so excited, like, as they were winning them. And then it got to the point where it was, like, it was almost like, this has to be a joke, right? Like, it's like a carry situation. Does this last award come with pig's blood? Like, what's going on? Because he had to get up and accept so many times. <laughs> I guess that can be pretty exhausting, right? Yeah. It gets to the point, like, what else can you say? And also that it just, it, that it starts to feel a little bit weird, I'm, I can imagine. But uh, it was really cool. It was great to see. Very I, much enjoyed it. What are you I, rewatching now? I, well, I was going to say, my final thought on the Emmys was I didn't realize right. it was on until it was on. Same. And I was watching football, so I wasn't going to flip to that. Uh, and it was a good game that night. So I didn't see it. But uh, it didn't seem like there was really any other than, like, some people were a little surprised that this won. All of them. Like, it doesn't think there was any huge surprises in it, right? Uh, not that I know of. So I, like, I, same with you. I didn't know it was on until it was already 30 minutes in. And by the time I turned it on, I, I got on just in time to see them sweep the category. And then that was it. <laughs> so I'm surprised because I thought you and Kim watch all the major. Oh, adventures. we do. Neither one of us realized it was on. Lack of lack of advertising of the Emmys. I did miss some of the like who won of like the major categories with the drama mm. stuff. I know that Jeremy Strong mm. won for playing Kendall. Um, Oh god, I totally forgot his last name in the show. Uh in succession. Uh he's like one of the the leads. He's the the well he's not the oldest son technically. He's the oldest full son. Um there's a half son who's older than him. Well, no, sorry, it's a full son, a half brother <laughs> older than him. 
Um, he's but he is the number one boy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one boy, boy number one. No, number one boy. It's very okay. important that it be uh, referred to as such. <laughs> okay. And he, you know, the first season, I thought like he did a good job or whatever. Um, and so I, maybe it's just material, but he was incredible in the second season. Um, I believe there were. Sorry, there's an Emmy for outstanding commercial. That's kind of funny. I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised. What one? Well, there's there's all those ones that you don't see aired. So ah, what well, what commercial one? Um. Back to school essentials. No, thank you. I don't know. The last thing I'm going to do is click on a video to watch a commercial. So I'm Fair. not going to check that out. You've, you've spent most of the past decade escaping commercials at all costs. That's right. You're goddamn Liter- right. Literally at all costs. At, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, the, the supporting, I forget who won supporting actor, but in the drama, but I know like three or four different actors from succession were nominated so none of them were ever going to win because they were going to always split that mm-hmm. um who ended up winning that i'm looking it up now so uh so outstanding drama series succession one yes i knew that um better call Saul was up for that which i appreciate mandalorian was also up for that which i think we talked about earlier we were both like i mean okay like i love the show love it yes but no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So supporting actress in the drama series, the winner was Julia Garner for Ozark. Outsto- outstanding supporting actor in the drama series was Billy Crudup for The Morning Show. That's right. Um, it's an interesting choice. So the... I know Zendaya this, won, right, for uh, lead actress? Um, For Euphoria? Please hold. This list is not great. Supporting actress in a... No, 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 no. Lead actor... Lead... Wait. <sighs> what is that? That's drama? I believe so. Uh, supporting actress in a drama. Supporting actor in a drama. Lead actress in a drama. Zendaya. Yep. Mm-hmm. Jeremy Strong was lead actor for Succession. Yes. And then... Outstanding limited series was Watchmen. Well deserved. Uh, anything else winning would have honestly been pretty comical. It was. They don't have a separate category for actor, actress in limit in the limited series, though, right? Yeah, they do. Oh, what, who won for that? Was did Regina did Regina King win? She did win. Okay, I thought yeah. that was lumped into the drama category. I don't know why. No, it was pulled out as a separate um, as a separate jam. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty sweet. This is what I was getting at. There's like outstanding director for a limited series or movie, and it. Like, all the other categories in this list show the nominees and the winner, like, has a mark next to it. And for directing and writing in a limited series, it's just the winner. So uh, that was an odd choice on Did, this list maker's part. <laughs> didn't didn't Watchmen win for a direction? Or... Uh, unorthodox one for directing of a limited series or a movie. Oh, uh, there was something else. In, oh, sorry. Was it was it an Andrama? Did Succession win? One of the Successions won one for that? For drama? Yeah. Uh, let's find out. Directing for a drama series. Succession. Writing for a drama series. Succession. What what episode? Uh, it doesn't say. Oh. Because I, I know it's for a particular episode, typically. Mm-hmm. Because I think uh, they had, like, three different episodes nominated or something like that. <laughs> hmm. Uh, last week tonight, one variety talk series. That was a silly one. They gave all of the uh, the hosts a box. And only the one with the award was going to (laughs) open. And it, like, explodes open on his desk. Is that how old that was? (laughs) Well, for this one. For this Uh. particular award, that's what they did. (laughs) Oh, that was very silly. But, uh, yeah. So that's cool. I was was bummed to have missed the beginning of it, because I usually like the intro of those things. But, uh... I heard the whole experience was a little weird with it. It was wonky, for sure. Partially... From home, but also partially not from home, and yeah, like people getting sick. And did someone fall on the red carpet? I believe. I don't know. There was a red carpet. I'm very confused. <laughs> I think kind of, if I'm remembering that correctly. I know they were using crowd shots that were from other previous Emmys. That's really funny. Like they were doing shots with like 
oh, this person is like nominated, but they were at this other Emmy, so we'll just show that shot or something like that's, that. That's that's kind of funny. I heard someone make a joke saying, I really feel bad for the intern who had to go through all this footage to make sure that no one who's like dead or canceled was like in the back of any of those shots. Ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good point. <clears throat> oh man. Anyway, that's the Emmys. What are what are we watching now? Uh so Funny thing happened on, I want to call it Saturday of this past weekend. Um, okay. Well, I just forget what day it was, okay? Yeah. It was a weekend. It's, it's almost as if you forgot what the days of the week were, the way that you said, I want to call it Saturday. <laughs> no, because it was either Friday night or Saturday or Sunday. I don't remember. Gotcha. Okay. I just know that I'm pretty sure I didn't have to get up for work the next day. Sure. Um, and it had to have been sometime after Wednesday. Because okay. what happened? So it was Friday or Saturday? Yes, probably. Or Sunday. No. Couldn't have been Sunday. It could have been because what follows next is what I did on Sunday. But you said you couldn't get up. You didn't have to get up for work the next well, day. Well, yeah, it's true. So I'm guessing it's Friday or Saturday night then. Yeah, because the I think it was. Diane Kruger effect again. What? <laughs> the Diane Kruger effect. No, this sounds more like Diane Kruger effect. <laughs> Is this Dylan McDermott or Dermot Mulroney? <laughs> <laughs> All right, what happened? Was watching TV and, sorry, was like half watching TV and heard a commercial for Archer. And I was like, oh, yeah, that pushback new season is supposed to be starting sometime soon, isn't mm. it? And like, so like I missed the beginning of the commercial and like they were showing like clips of like both old Archer, I want to believe, and also stiff stuff from the new season. And I was like, oh, yeah, what day is that? And they're like, Airing Wednesdays. And I was like, but when? And then I went to the DVR. I was like, oh, it aired this past Wednesday. So nice. it will just be Wednesdays from now on. Great. And then I remembered, you know, twice the joy because FX and FX on Hulu. Sure. Sorry, Brian. Uh, airs two episodes to start every new season now. So Score. I got to watch the first two episodes of Archer. Um, it's now back to being just Archer. It's not Archer Dreamland. It's not Archer Vice. It's not Archer... But with the other one, Danger Island, Archer, <laughs> 1999. It was none of those things. It's simply Archer. Um, it was great to have it back. It's awesome. Had a pretty strong start the first two episodes. Um, I don't remember how much of what has happened the last several seasons I've said to you or not, but the dynamic has shifted. But then it's also exactly the same. But they kind of mixed up the rules and they're playing with convention a little bit but also very clearly leading back to the original conventions predominantly. Okay. But, like, they're doing it in ways that work with the story and the characters, and it lets them play around in the sandbox a little bit without having the wholesale, I don't want to say rewrite, but total recasting of the characters that the, like, standalone seasons did. Mm. But it's nice to see it back and a great time. Even though it's the first season now with... Adam Reed not running the show. He's the one who created it. He's the one who voices okay. Ray on the show. He's still there voicing Ray on the show. Um, which also... He's, what's that? He's, like, stepped away from, like, the... the yeah, runner. he's not the showrunner anymore. Yeah. Which brings to mind something I just heard this week that I had no idea. I, well, I wondered if that was awkward, still being involved as, mm. like, one of the main characters on the show, but not running the show that you created and ran for a decade. Yeah. It's got to be weird. Uh, and it brings <laughs> Every time they're like, yeah, that's not how I would do it. Just yeah, just right? Imagine. You, would, you would wonder, like, and how do you not... Or or during all of that, they're like, thank God I don't have to do this shit. <laughs> well, there's probably, like, an aspect of that, but, like, on the other hand, like, don't you still feel responsible? Like, don't you still kind of want ownership of the thing? Like, do you want someone else playing in your sandbox? Right. Like, there's a difference between giving an episode to someone to write or direct, because you're still involved, right? Like, because that's what happens with TV, right? A showrunner yeah. will be in the writing room, they'll be, like, maybe the lead writer, but there's entire episodes or sections of episodes given to certain people. Maybe they write a certain character, maybe they write a certain right. storyline that's running. They generally episodes. keep, like, a continuity and, like, a feel. Yeah, or you hand mm -hmm. off episodes to be directed that you wrote, but you're still there on the lot while they're directing it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a collaborative like process. I have to imagine if you're stepping away from being a showrunner, you're not part of like the collaborative process of making it anymore. It's got to be awkward. Yeah, I don't know. But I was listening to Armchair the other day with Seth MacFarlane, and 
I didn't realize he hasn't run Family Guy for almost a decade. Really? I didn't yeah. know that either. Okay. Like, considering he still does, like, 70% of the voices on the show, I just assumed that he was still, like, even if he kind of was giving more and more control to other writers, I right. just kind of assumed it was still his show. It's not. You know, it's funny. It's dawned on me. I haven't seen that show in a very long time. This is probably this entire, this year's worth of content that I haven't seen. Correct. Which is pretty great. That Like, at any point, if I wanted to, it's there. Yeah, I mean, the last couple of years, there's a lot of episodes that were like, that was fun. Yeah. Um, They still get, every once in a while, one that's really strong. But, like, it used to be in, like, a 20-episode season that, like, 10 of them were incredible and five of them were really, really good. And then the other five were hit or miss. Right. Now it feels like... It's kind of the paradigm shifted a little bit. Yeah, which is disappointing. Yeah. Um, it's the type it's of also thing like that, the nature of a show that goes on for that long. Sure. It just feels like they mix up the formula in such a way that it tends to feel very generic and disposable a lot of times. Uh, okay. Like, when they do big event episodes, they're still really good. But, like, the random episodes aren't as entertaining. Mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. if they just ran out of, like, things to do, but... Yeah, I find that it's funny, like, I, I, it's not the same thing, but, like, for Saturday Night Live, for example, like, they've got, they've been doing this forever. It's weekly when it's live, and it's, there's, there are, more often than not, there are just meh episodes, but every once in a while, there's one that just tickles you, and, uh, and it's great, and, and, and it's, it's almost, it's worth going back over and over again just to hit that one that'll be that funny. Yeah, but the other thing was something like Saturday Night Live, where it's an hour and a half long, right? And there's however many, yeah. 10 or whatever sketches. Mm-hmm. Like, you could have a pretty meh episode that has one really good sketch. That's true. And with Family Guy, like, the equivalent of that would be, you could have a meh episode, but if you have one great cutaway, it, like, salvages it. Because, like, you're that, that cutaway is going to probably stick with you. Sure. And I don't even feel like they're always doing that. I got you. That's a bummer. Yeah. But then every once in a while, like, one will come up and I was like, oh, wow, that was actually pretty damn good. Yeah. It's just, like, it's not enough to make an appointment television for me anymore. Like, it's just, like, sure. they, they pile up on my DVR, and when I get bored or I have nothing to watch, I knock them on. out one or two or three, and it's like, okay. But it's not a priority for me. Yeah, like those types of shows, like little like one-off things like that, I used to watch when I would commute to Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> that was that, I, that was obnoxious. <laughs> that was perfect for when you took the sip. That was very. That, I mean, my, obviously was going for Laszlo there. <laughs> Manhattan. <laughs> is he saying like that whole episode? Is he saying Manhattan? And then when they go, I'm like, that's what he's saying. Oh, that was I the Nick, the Nick love Kroll episode, right? this character. <laughs> yeah, it's the Nick Kroll episode. What were the name of the What were the name of the crew of vampires? Because they were so ridiculous. Oh. He have, he had the, one of them was like a rapper name, right? Yeah, uh, I don't remember it. That was it. Was it's a, it's a that was a great episode though. Well, if you enjoyed that, I'll give you a very brief spoiler. He's back for an episode. Oh, thank God. I am so glad. Is he Along like with at least some of the crew? Okay, cool. Cool. And his creepy wife. Awesome. And I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So you're watching Archer. Anything else? I want to say no. Cool. I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I feel am... like I should be able to say that with conviction. Sure. I'm, I'm about three or four episodes into season five of Dexter. Just kind of cruising along. It's a, big, it's a big paradigm shift after four and sure yeah it's uh it's it's good the i'm i'm currently uh i'm digging the cast right now i'm uh certain they, characters they, are they coming shake it up a little bit yeah i uh honestly when the show started i was like Actually, get masuka off the screen and now i'm like get masuka on the screen i was just about to ask about like him in particular but i was gonna say we haven't really talked about your feeling about any of the cast, and you're now past halfway of done with the show. Yeah. Um, like I've asked you about seasons and storylines, but um, yeah, tell me, tell me uh, what your thoughts are on, on like the general cast. But yeah, because Masuka, yeah, because he's such a bad like stereotype of like just the creepy perv at the office, and then eventually yeah. he becomes a character. And he becomes a character in the in the Thanksgiving episode. 
Yes, which is where he three? It, uh, four. Four. Sorry. He brings his patented lava cakes. Yes, the lava cakes, uh, which he throws it. away. And when he throws them in the garbage, it's probably the same. Like, and this is a season where some really crappy stuff goes down. The say, saddest scene of the say, season is when the he puts, season is when he threw that yeah, out. Knowing it's when he throws the lava out. cakes away. It's the defeat of Masuka's eyes when he throws the lava cakes away that really takes the cake. The saddest scene in the season. <laughs> you really said what takes the cake. <laughs> I did. I was really hoping that you would catch that. <laughs> uh, but I, I, anyway, he's uh, he's fantastic. Um, now he's fantastic. Now he's not early on. They. They figure out how he figures out how to. I actually think it's more the writers than him. He's he's a. I think he's a good actor. Yeah, it's not on. It's not on the the actor. It's on the writer. Exactly. They they forced those those nonsense jokes in. Where now they they added personality and storytelling to the character, and then he gets to do those things. Which well, I feel yeah, like they also like instead of him being like, okay, this dude's like super problematic it's like oh no like he is really harmless like he's not yeah bad no because, like, like almost like we'll do anything for you that could have gone down where he's actually like one of the people dexter eventually hunts down right <laughs> but uh yeah it's uh no he, I, he's I, i'm enjoying him these days i i've since episode since the first season i really like angel i think he's awesome yeah he's always kind of like one of like the moral centers of the show well, I've always gravitated towards that character. I like those characters. Yeah. Um, uh, they're just like a. It's, it's just like a good North Star. I feel like for everything else going on. You know, I was um, watching like a couple weeks ago, and I always forget that he has a very bit part in that is Rounders. Uh, he is one of the. He's one of the police officers at the the poker game that they play, where they get their ass kicked and they get thrown out. Oh it's man, cool. I only i I remember that that sequence. I don't remember him. I'll have to. I'll have well, there's to no reason that. for you to remember him, not having known who he was at the time. Sure, sure. But uh, so I believe he was also was he not also the villain in the first Expendables? I don't know. Well, there's like there's a white dude. Is it Eric Roberts? Maybe who's like the real main villain, but there's like... That a, feels a, right. That seems like the appropriate casting for that movie. There's a dictator in some South or Central American country that is like his puppet, and that's him, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, so I like him. I've been liking Masuka lately. Um, I think that... I bet I bet you don't like LaGuardia because there's no reason to. They, they do a poor job of writing her. At times. Um... <laughs> She's just, the thing is, they they just need to put a little, like just a little bit more effort, and I think she'd be more compelling. Like they they make you dislike her right out of the gate, uh, and then they don't do like basically with the friction between her and Deborah, it's unwarranted. They don't give you enough of a reason for that, and then they don't really reconcile it. They just kind of get rid of that. They just they just take that off. That's just that's just not really a thing anymore. Well, the thing with her and Deb is it always waxes and wanes and mm. that in it of itself is its characterization of the where Spill to be. beer all over myself. Just yeah, so I was going to let that one slide. Appreciate it. Down your chin. Uh, <laughs> nice. um, and boy, did I. <laughs> the, 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 sorry, that whole ebb and flow between her and Deb is its own bit of characterization of the where to, because that's who she is. She only has time for you if you can do something for her. Yeah. So when things are good between her and Deb, it's because her keeping Deb close to her is something that benefits her. And when she has no need of her is when they end up sniping at each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, I mean, that's. I guess that's, that's kind of true of all the characters because her own dalliance with Angel and all of that uh, goes along with that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just not a, it's, I mean, th there's a weird thing between, like, not a likable character and not liking the character. I don't know, do you know what I mean? Like, they, I feel like it's a, there's a shortcoming of the writing of that character, in my opinion. Well, as funny as, as flawed as the character is, Captain Matthews has the best line on her. Because he recognizes her because he has a lot of it himself. It's just that he feels like he actually earned his place. And mm -hmm. he feels like she didn't. But she he recognizes the same ambitious political animal in her that he has in himself. Right. Right. 
Yeah, that's, he, he's an interesting one. I don't really have any strong feelings on him. I, I, They do a good job with him of like, I hate him in the scenes where I'm supposed to hate him and I'm okay with him in the scenes where I am. So that means that they are writing him specifically for that and the actor is carrying it out. Yes, he's, he's, a, he's a pretty solid actor. I, I yeah. forget what else I've seen him in. He's been in a couple of things. He gets some uh, good one-liners throughout the course of the show. I've been really, uh, this particular season, um, I'm enjoying Quinn, who is becoming uh, <laughs> the new Dokes. Which is I I kind of like what's happening here of him like starting Dokes. to get on to Dexter, which is pretty great. <laughs> Fucking Dokes. Dokes, Dokes ha- really- is part of one of the great memes of all time online. Oh yeah, yeah. Surprise, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, I uh, honestly the entire time I was watching the first two seasons, I was like, is he gonna say it now? <laughs> is he gonna say it now? And then when I saw them in the shipping yard, I was like, oh my god, he's gonna say. It. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <"Wow." laughs> yeah, then it, then it happens. Like, also, I'm really excited. That's the first time. That you maybe even see any sort of fear in Dokes, but you also see vindication, right? Because yeah, Dexter gets him, and he's like, "Oh, I have thought he was just this yeah, like Weasley little like science dork, and no, there is a tiger hidden behind those." Right, and I uh, I didn't like him because of the intention behind the way that they made it, so that you were it was a hard to like character, but you also understand to a degree. Well, so that you, was cool. You don't like him because he's the one who is always diametrically opposed to right. the protagonist, even though ultimately he's the good guy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like like I said, it's like it's that same thing of like I didn't like the character, and that is a success on their part. Like that was the point. I feel like is they like you technically should be on board with him, yes. but you're not, and that's the that's what they were going for. And between his execution of that character. And the way that it was written, I think it was very well done. What did you think um, about Brian? Brian. By me? What? What? What was the what was the name that? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. I uh, was it by me? That's uh, that sounds close to what he was or saying. B- by me or by me? I forget. By me? Like yeah. Um, he was fine. That was uh, that was another one. So here's the thing. I mean, I guess spoilers for the first season of Dexter. Yeah, that came out what like fifteen years ago. Yeah. yeah, I I was watching it and vividly remembered, I don't know, eighty percent of the first season, and I I do not remember watching it at all. Huh. So I don't know if maybe like Michael Warren was watching it when we were roommates at one okay. point, which is very possible. And I was just like either in and out of the room or something. Um, but like I was like when he when as it was un like unfolding. And like, there's this, you know, they're trying to figure out who this killer. I was like, I'm pretty sure the killer that they're referring to that's doing this exact work is dating Dexter's sister. And then I was like, but we haven't been introduced to Dexter's sister's boyfriend yet. And then she gets a boyfriend. I was like, that's him. That's the guy. (laughs) And I'm like, this is very underwhelming. (laughs) Well, it's a little uh, different when you know it's coming. (laughs) Which was weird because I was like, I half knew it was coming. I, I still, I still don't know. When or why I saw it, but regardless, um, I think Deb might be my favorite character. I always liked Deb. I, or uh, I was, for the most part, I always thought she was a pretty well written character. There's a a section of it in the last two seasons, off and on, where I didn't think the writers did her credit. Um, in the second season? No, no. In the final two seasons. In the final season. Oh, final two seasons. Gotcha. Um. Yeah, well, there was things going on behind the scene because in real life, the two of them got married and divorced during the run of the show. Who did? Uh, Michael C. Hall and um, oh. what's her name? I don't know her real name. I, yeah, I, I, I barely remembered his real name. They are now Dexter and Depp. <laughs> I totally. I just realized as I was getting to her name that I totally don't remember it. I want to uh-huh. say it's Jennifer something. I don't. Okay. But does that, it takes a toll on their chemistry or... Yeah, well, I think it's the chemistry. I think the writing was affected by that. I think they, looking back at it, because I didn't know when I was watching it, and I found out, like, after, and I was like, oh, this makes more sense now. Uh, I think they channeled the real-life divorce into what they were writing, because the interesting becomes antagonistic. Hmm. Uh, it's, there's some good, and there's some bad to that. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, like I said, so, so right as of as of, I would say, she's probably my favorite of the characters right now, uh, or our has been really. She, she's great. She's great. She's like a, she's kind of a ridiculously written character. Like her, all of her shticks, like they're they're really funny. Like funny in a show that is very drama heavy. Like, yeah, I mean, like it is a, definitely a drama, but there is a pretty good amount of humor in it. Yeah, but like her, well, yeah, her, dark, but her, she. Uh, Skinny white bitch. She said Santa Muerta, and it was, <laughs> and they all laugh at her. And they, it was when they explained it to her, the fact that she was able to chuckle at it too was really funny. <laughs> and I just, I thought that was a great scene. Um, but uh, that like stuff like that, like also like just her her ridiculously like the foul mouth stuff that she says, and then also when she's spending more time with Masuka. He starts to say things similar to how she says them, and it's really funny. Yeah, but anyway, um, the, the things that she comes out with, Kim and I will just rewind it. And be like, "What? Wait, what did she just say?" <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, one of the things I liked about that show was how many great cameos and, in fact, like guest stars across like a season or part of a season they get. Because there's a really good list of them. I mean, I guess not maybe in the first season. But in the second season, they added Keith Carradine as Frank Lundy, who was great. Oh, yeah. Great character. Rest yep. in peace. Um, obviously, John Lithgow was great. Um, what's his name was great. Uh, oh, I totally forgot his name. The, the guy who played his friend in the third season. He was in Star Wars. He was. In- oh, I. Yeah, I didn't totally really care for. Um, oh, what the hell's his name? Schmidt. J- uh, Jimmy Smith. Jimmy Smith. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. That uh, that season was frustrating, but yeah. See, I love that season. Yeah, no, that's I, I I've heard people saying that that was a great season, but it, it was not for me. Um, four season, yeah. Sorry, I had, I had Lithgow and the yep. return of Carradine. Um, fifth season has Frank Weller in most of it, which is great. What's his name? Uh, Robocop. Oh, okay. And also, well, he wasn't super famous at that time, but the guy who plays. Sherlock Holmes on that show Elementary mm-hmm. with Lucy Liu yep. and I forgot that actress the blonde actress Julia Stiles. So, yeah that's it her I, well that was funny uh, I actually just saw the the episode where we uncover her and I was well, like oh I know who that is I guess I, she's going to be around a while <laughs> yeah I was just about to say I was like I don't remember if you got to her yet like, so it just sounds like you just saw the episode that She's Johnny a- Lee Miller is who you were talking about. Yes, before. yes. I was never going to remember his name. Of train spotting fame. I didn't know he was in that. Um, Sick boy. Six season has Colin Hanks and huh. Mo- Most Deaf and Edward James Olmos. Oh, what? <laughs> Cast of characters. All right. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's, there's some great, like, like get, and like all of them have pretty long runs on nice. that season. Um, season seven brings in one of my f- well, I always, like, he cracks me up in, in <laughs> he's been in a few things in bit parts, but he always cracks me up in the other guys. The guy who, who has, like, plays the head of the, like, that, that team of, like, specialists that's, like, constantly, like, hunting them down. The guy with the Australian accent, he plays, like, a Russian, like, mobster in the seventh season. Um, he's really good in it. He cracks me up in the other guys. He's been in a couple other things. He was in the first couple of Thors. He was, uh... I always forget the their names, you know, like the was it the the Warriors three or whatever. He's, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's he's one of them. Uh, Yvonne Shahovsky's in it. She's great. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple other people I think who pop in here and there for the show, and then I guess really the only oh sorry eighth season brings in Charlotte Rampling, who she, she just won an Oscar a couple of years ago, I think, and one of the guys from Boondock Saints, the one who isn't, um, what's his name from The Walking Dead. <laughs> The okay. other one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Ray Stevenson. Yeah, that's the guy from yeah. uh, the other guys. That's funny. <laughs> the, the one that's not in The Walking Dead. Yeah, because I, I totally forgot Norman Reedus' name for a minute. And <laughs> it's like, you know, the one who isn't. That's fair. <laughs> Sean Patrick Flannery. Yeah, it's him. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm in, I mean, I'm in, I'm in it. I've been, I've been kind of breezing through it, actually. Yeah, I mean, the storylines get a little ridiculous in the last couple of seasons, but like I said, I still think that it's more entertaining than not. Sure. Um, and it gets more entertaining when you get other, like, cool 
like actors and actresses in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's what we're watching. Are you interested in doing some fun and games? Uh, when am I not? When are you not? All right. Uh, for this week's fun and games, I came across... So I do... Generally, what I do is the title of the movie and quiz or who are you from and the title of the movie to see if I could find anything. Okay. And then uh, in the depths, I came across this website called SewerGator.com. Now, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, and I refuse to find out. Don't like but it was a link directly to a quiz, and I'm not going to explore the site any further. Um, Probably for the best. This quiz is vulgar. I'm going to put that out there. Who would have thought? And uh, much like the movie. Now, there's a caveat here. We're talking about Glenn Gary Glenn Ross in a little bit. Um, there are some things that are said in the movie. There are some lines that are not appropriate today. They weren't appropriate then, but we're more aware of how not appropriate they are now. Yeah, the... I was a little shocked by how violently Alec Baldwin screams that. Yeah. So I will, um, I, I, as I read this stuff, I'll probably, I'm going to do my best. If I, if I'm reading it quickly and I mess up, I'll just, I might cut it or I might just skip over certain things. Just so you know, if, it, if the questions sound weird. Okay. Okay. Just going to get in there because I needed to take you be through required from this quiz. <laughs> poten potentially. Cause I came when I read through, I, I answered it a bunch real quick and just to see if like the results have like something fun in them. And it did have like a character and had some like stuff about it. So I thought that was a good idea, but the things that it said after that were pretty gnarly. Was so this, was this quiz invented in 1992? Uh, maybe <laughs> uh, it, the website certainly looks that way. <laughs> Uh, but let's start this off, because the first thing that it says in this website is it takes brass balls to take this quiz. <laughs> <laughs> what a ridiculous sight gag that was. And it says online quizzes. What are they? An opportunity? To what? To waste time? Perhaps. To waste a lot of time? Perhaps. To indulge and learn about ourselves? Bullshit. Here's a quiz. And maybe that's true. I'll let it tell you. <laughs> I don't know. It's all over the place. A preamble and then, to the quiz? Yeah, that's the preamble to the quiz. And then the title of the quiz is Which Fucking Glen Gary Glen Ross Character Are You? If one of so, the answers, one of the results at the end isn't Randy St. Randy, I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> and ready? How often do you swear? Every fucking other fucking word. Some of the fucking time. Hardly fucking ever. <laughs> Uh, I was hoping this was going to be one of those four option ones, because I'm somewhere between some of the fucking time and every fucking other fucking... All right, we'll do some for that one. Okay, that seems fair. Your drinking habits are best described as light to moderate, moderate to heavy, hard to say, as you can never remember how much you drank. <laughs> say moderate to heavy. Okay. Coffee is for closers only, drinking, sobering up. Um... Well, just considering the frequency and volume of coffee, I'm going to go with closers only because I drink a lot of it. Okay. At work, are you hot? Hot if you could only get the support? Doing what you're paid to do? No fucking good. <laughs> hot. Okay. Your moral compass points to true north, could use some adjustment, was broken the day it came out of the Cracker Jack box. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with True North. I want you to know that uh, the image that is accompanying every single one of these questions is Alec Baldwin's hand with his index finger as a penis holding the brass balls. <laughs> All right. Which of the following statements makes the most sense to you? One point, in fact, of which I spoke to you, of which I can't talk to you about it here. <laughs> Sorry, this is the one that makes yes. the most sense to me? <laughs> yes. I forgot about that sentence, but then you said it, and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that word salad. Yep. Actually, I believe, I believe, I watched this movie with my sleeping dad and my barely interested mom, and my brother who showed up half an hour late to the start of the movie. Mm. And I believe when that line was uttered, I even said out loud, wow, that was a spectacular word salad. Yep. So that one, that one was, that one's pretty good. Uh, the next one is, well, I'm not a leash, so I don't know, do I? <laughs> <laughs> Which is also pretty great. I think something has to be fed, uh, watered, and painted. You know. Are you just talking about this, or were you just talking about it? <laughs> that was the one that made the most sense somehow. And then the last option is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it 
All right, so are you talking about this? Yeah, the the Arkham line. Okay. Somebody is making life difficult for you at work. You. Read him the riot act. Try to bribe him. Scream at him semi-coherently. <laughs> ignore him as best you can. Insist he follows the rules or get out. Harangue him mercilessly and take away his coffee. Apologize to him because it's probably your fault. <laughs> Um, you know, what the hell is the riot act? Because I know that expression and I have no idea what it actually means. Yeah, I actually don't know. I know the expression as well. I'm going to go with that one, although I feel like that overlaps with yelling at him. I I don't know. Semi-coherently? Yeah, well, I guess the riot act may be more coherent. Yeah. All right. And now the final and potentially best question of this quiz. (laughs) Will you go to lunch? That was actually great. Will you go to lunch? Will you? Will you go to lunch? Go to lunch. Will you go to lunch? (laughs) Somehow, that probably makes it, maybe not on the Mount Rushmore, but I'll say the top ten line deliveries in Kevin Smith's career. (laughs) Yeah. It's really pretty strong. It is. It has no business, that line in and of itself, while somewhat funny, has no reason to be as funny as it is except for him. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. So, will you go to lunch? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Let's find out who you are. Okay. You got Rick. Your Glengarry Glen Ross character is Ricky Roma. Nice. Uh, Unencumbered by self doubt or any sense of morality, you see what you want and take it. In a world of clock watchers and bureaucrats, you manage to be a real man. Not burdened by sentimentalism. You choose your friends for whatever material gain they can offer you. And then underneath that, it says your testosterone rating is 100 out of 100. <laughs> oh. So it's funny because, you know, a lot of times when we're done with this, the majority of the times I feel like, oh, wow, that like, th- that's pretty close. Like, I-, I feel like I've said that quite a few times. Most of that is not true. Uh, I pretty specifically said my compass points to true north and that said I had no morality. So No morality, zero. There. Which is probably a random generator of some kind. Um, that being said, some of the other things, I kind of like the testosterone thing. I'm definitely not a clock watcher. I get shit done. Um, it's funny because, yeah, he was really the only one who seemed competent in that movie, and yet not as competent as he thought. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, with that, let us get into our flick of the week. Glen Gary Glen Ross, released in 1992, rated R at an hour and 40 minute runtime. For IMDb synopsis, an examination of the machinations behind the scenes at a real estate office. Uh, Hardly. Hardly. (laughs) Uh, No, I mean, I guess not not, not so much. It really, I feel like it's really like a behind the scenes. It's like a a deep dive into like uh, almost the caricature of a salesman's persona. Um, Whereas also maybe not so much a character caricature in certain situations because <laughs> I've definitely met salespeople like this that I've worked with in the past um, that I'm like, oh, like, you're really good at pretending we're friends. <laughs> uh, it's tough because technically, like, I have sales components to what I do. Mm-hmm. And, like... I mean, everyone learns how to wear different masks. Some people wear them better than others. Some people wear more of them than others. Mm -hmm. And I don't always view that inherently as being dishonest per se, because sometimes it's defense mechanism. Sometimes it's what you got to do to get along. Sometimes it's to get what you want, right? But a lot of times it it really is just how best to fit in with what's going on. Mm. And... So my ability to slip in and out of wearing certain masks has been tested in being involved with some of the sales stuff. And sure, you can't lose track of who you are. Like you do have to do certain things. You do have to be persuasive, but mm-hmm. and I don't know. Maybe I'm losing out on five or ten percent of what I could be getting if I were to throw all my morals away like a Ricky Roma, but sure. Well, I don't I, think I, I'm I losing out that much by not being a creep. That all of them, except maybe Alan Arkin, are have go like have completely they they have no other personality except the fake ones that they've put up at this point. Yeah, um, we never really see Arkin sell. 
No, no, which is actually pretty funny. Which we can let's get we'll get into that. But uh, first, why don't you give me a tweet length review? Sure. If I can open the tab that I have it on. Sure. Uh, <laughs> its roots as a play are very much evident as plot falls by the wayside in favor of passion, prose, and performance. 7.5 out of 10. Hmm, that was a much more eloquent version of what I have here. Fast talk, double talk, cross talk, back talk. This talk, he certainly talks the talk. 8 out of 10. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, 100%. I, I'm with you all the way on... Uh, it's clearly written as a play, shot as a movie. Yes. Um, which I think was a great choice, was to keep it as the play in the film version. Yeah, which I didn't know until I saw it in the opening credits, like, based on the play written by David Mamet. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, uh, I, I feel like it would have been, it would have done the movie a disservice to to change the cadence of the delivery of everything. Because there's almost something... Uh, fake about the way they deliver their their lines to each other like in that like the, the characters what i found throughout the movie is that the is that our core cast of salesmen are like salesmen at every angle with their clients with each other with their boss with the cops like it's crazy well and by, that's i was gonna say by the end of the movie as I was getting ready to jump in the shower because I felt so dirty from this movie, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god, they can never stop selling each right. other themselves." Yeah, it's dark. It gets dark when you start to really think about it. It's it is. dark. It's really dark. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's also nasty because they also like. The lengths that they're going to to basically swindle because it sounds like everything that they're selling in this case they're not good deals. So <laughs> no, and also you have to realize if like at that point, right when none of them are any sort of successful, it's like oh, the worst possible product with the worst possible deals would only attract the worst possible salesmen. Mm -hmm. Like they're none of them are any good at it, right? Except for maybe uh, Al Pacino's character, Ricky Roman. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> But it's actually, it's more that he, it's not that he's good at selling it. It's that he's good at confusing the person. Yes. Which is, uh, which comes into play a lot in the movie. He's got, he's a funny character. So I, I have this note here. It's a question more for you. Kind of curious. Right? Al Pacino's best role? <laughs> because he's, he nails this character. And I think that he has some crazy deliveries throughout the performance. It's his most efficient role. Okay. I think by reining him in and not giving him a ton of screen time, they allowed his best work to not become parody of itself. Mm. And while watching this, this movie came out in 1992, I was wondering, when exactly did he become that? Yeah, I don't know. Because, like, I've laughed about it, like, now. Like, with, like, the movies he's made in the last ten years, it's like, okay, like, when did he like go into this full vote blown parody version of himself? This right. is the earliest chronological movie I've seen him in where and it's both his look and his delivery. Yeah. But the delivery is the thing I'm most con When did he become that? He totally changed his voice and his delivery. Yeah. And I want to know when and I like, want to know why. Why? <laughs> yeah, it's like he that when he became Al Pacino. Yeah, because that guy is not the guy who when, when was... he became Al Ua Pacino. <laughs> I, I, I I'm remiss to not remember this, but did he win or was he nominated for Oscars for his work in the first two Godfathers? I don't know. I would assume so, but I actually don't know. That would have been. I would have just guessed that, but um, yeah, I'm gonna stall briefly while I look. At yeah, yeah, up because I he definitely wasn't this in the first Godfather. And actually, I don't think I've ever even finished watching the second one. Um, he wasn't that in that one either from the parts of it that I've saw him in. Right. Um, Man, I don't... No, he, he only won for Scent of a Woman, which is the same year as this. He was okay. nominated for this as well. Wow, he was nominated for two Oscars that year. <laughs> but no, are you saying he started to turn into the opportunity that we know here, or he's not that? Here. No, I want to know when did he turn into this? Yeah, because okay, so here, uh, you know, I forgot. Scarface? Did Scarface just get to him? 
Maybe. <laughs> um, so he was nominated uh, for The Godfather. He was nominated for Serpico, which was the year after. He was nominated mm-hmm. for Godfather Part Two, which was the year after that. Jesus Christ, he was nominated four years in a row. He was nominated nice. in 75 for Dog Day Afternoon. He was nominated in 79 for And Justice for All. And then he was nominated in 1990 for Dick Tracy, then 92 for Glengarry Glen Ross and Sense of a Woman. It's pretty Memphis, wacky in Dick Sense Tracy as well. Woman. And then he was nominated for The Irishman last year, which I totally forgot. Oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I want to know when he became this ridiculous character. Because, like, he was good in this. Mm-hmm. I understand why he was nominated. I'd like to see what other movies were, or what other, like, roles were nominated for that Sure. Year. But like, he was good. He was entertaining, for sure. Um, I just, like, his voice and his cadence and his delivery are entirely different than they were 20 years earlier in yeah. The Godfather. Yeah, you're He's right. He's a legitimately really good actor in The Godfather. What happened? Well, that, that, see, like, that's the thing where it's like, it's almost like he was playing, you know, he played a character in those movies where I feel like all, make, then afterwards it was like Al Pacino in Glenn, Glenn Gary, Glenn, do you know what I mean? Like where it's more it feels like the association like, you make with him. Yeah, I feel, it feels like he's become Nicolas Cage. Yeah, uh, I can see that. Is that I what it was? That. Like, did he try and go off the rails and keep chasing bigger swings? Like, more artistic, more different, more, I have to be more every time to outdo what Maybe. I did the last time? Like, what happened? It could be. Acting's a hell of a drug. <laughs> I guess I guess so, because it just doesn't make any sense to me. But you know what's funny, though? There is also... I, while I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from, and he is a, he can be like, he gets wacky, I will say, of all of them, I do feel like he's potentially doing, well, actually, uh, I feel like it's him and Kevin Spacey are probably doing the best acting in the movie, followed very closely, if not at the same level, by Jack Lemmon. Yeah, I thought Lemmon did a really good job. The, the thing is, like, you want to compare him and Spacey, who get limited screen time, right? Like, they right. have to really make the most of each scene. Mm-hmm. Spacey, the majority of time when he's really acting, doesn't even look like he's acting. Yeah. But, you know, I can practically see the strain. Now, it doesn't mean that the product isn't good. It's just, like, do less, man. Do they pop up? Yes! Yeah. I, uh, Kunu. Kunu uh, has the way. That, that was, I will agree with you in his, his expression and his... Um, his mannerisms and the way that he moves his body, he's a little, he overacts a bit. Because However, because like, the, the the scene when Jonathan Price comes in to break the contract, mm-hmm. he stops all that bullshit. Yeah, and he acts. Yeah, and that's what he's getting nominated for, right? Is that scene? Uh, probably, it's got to be all the bullshit. And I like, and I get he's playing a character that's like full of bravado and this and that, but like even the scenes when he's not, when the quote unquote the character isn't trying to project. Yeah. He's doing too much. Yeah, like when he goes on his bullshit philosophical monologues. Yeah. Like where it's like, wait, you like you just said a lot of nothing. Which I understand is the character. No, I'm fine with the nothing because you're right, that's the character. It's the way he's Yeah, it's it's because it's, that's it's, been it's his extra. Default, <laughs> that's been his default state for the past thirty years. Yeah. Like he's not yeah. acting there. He's just reading the lines. Like and that's not a knock. Like it's just not every line needs to be Oscar worthy, right? Like they, That's like, right. Like, there can be an economy of movement and all of that. All of that bullshit falls away in that scene with Jonathan Price. Mm-hmm. That, it's like, where is that guy? Why do you push that guy down and do this other thing? Yeah. Do it the other way around. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that's about. There, but uh, on the topic of, like, of the, way, of the way those performances are executed, one of the things that I found interesting is when it comes to a play, like, plays are executed in a tight timeline consistently every night twice on Wednesday twice on Saturday right like they're like done like uh and they like they get like a cadence down and it's almost to the point of um the lines are delivered on cue right where almost where it's it it feels a little bit less like the characters interacting sometimes as much as it does character delivers this next character delivers that and when it came to uh, Ed Harris and Alan Arkin, it very much felt that way. It was just like, 
Well, especially that hit one your scene cue where, and deliver was, the lines. That one scene was it when they were in the car? Or when they yes, were in the it's bar? in the car. It's in where, the car, they, and then in the car, and then in the bar. <laughs> I don't even remember what they were saying now, but like they kept saying the same thing back and forth to each other. Yep, they're and because like, they're both just talking, not with, but at each other. Yes, it's it's very odd. But it was uh, like watching people play tennis. Yeah, yeah, yes. It was, it's so, it's so strange, but I will say like, they did that. And I do feel like that, that happened a lot of times, uh, at Harris character was on screen. So I feel like it might've been him and maybe not nailing the, like the transition from like the playwright to a script, but the other characters, I feel like did a better job of blending them. I do think Al Pacino blended that better. I think that, uh, Jack Lemmon did it fantastically. Well, and, it also it also depended on what this I think the script required at that time because that patter between the two of like between Sarkin and Harris mm-hmm. is very intentional in that moment of yeah. this is supposed to have a rhythmic cadence. I while I agree, I think that Arkin was doing a better job of seeming to respond where Ed Harris was just saying the lines. It was yeah. I I don't know how to, else to describe it, but it felt like one well, was that, more that probably, acting. I think you're probably right, but I think that actually goes to the character because could, it could be, yeah. Like it just seemed like Harris was. I won't say the better salesman, but the one who was trying harder. Sure. Well, he was very much not thinking about anybody but himself. Yes, and yeah. he's trying to sell Arkin in that scene. Yeah, and but Arkin's it, not, so he is trying to understand what's going on. That, that's that scene is is. Is pretty great. What were they saying? I don't even remember now. Which is like this uh, is what I was talking about before we got started recording. Where I was like, like, there's certain things that I just like, like I remember the 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 spirit of what was going on. Yeah, but I don't remember any of the lines. They're there. talking about robbing uh, the. They're talking about uh, uh, yeah, robbing the office and get and taking the leads. And <laughs> Argan says to Harris, "We're speaking about it as an idea, not talking about it as a robbery." <laughs> Well, no, <laughs> that was later in the bar, but there was something where they kept asking the same question back and forth to each other. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't remember exactly what that was, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, they, they do keep... And it, it actually, I think that's how that... That's the, the cap at the end of that, but the whole conversation in the car and at the bar, I feel like, is them going back and forth. We're just talking about this, right? Yeah, it's well, talking. Yeah. Who's, you're talking? I'm talk, like, we're just talking about it. Like, we're talking... And they, it no, goes... no, that, that, that was Poe Dameron in episode seven. Yeah, I talk first. You, talk, I you talk. talk, you talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Uh, yeah, so there is there's definitely something funky to the line delivery, specifically because of the way that it translates as a play to the screen. Um, it definitely feels more like a play in that sense, which I'm okay with. I just it's just a notable thing where it's like it blends the stage and screen really well, and like it makes the movie unique because they did a movie set but they did like stage play blocking and line delivery Mm -hmm. which is really cool and also obviously you don't get this in a play but you get it in the movement of the characters and there's some Mm -hmm. of it on screen but because they got to play around with conventions of having cameras and change perspectives that thing where you get where like people like they keep resetting the stage where I'm here and then I'm over there and now we're sitting yeah. this way and now we're sitting. Instead, the camera pans and pivots around, which adds like a really cool play on that convention. Yeah, it almost puts the audience on the stage versus making it feel like a movie. Yeah, well, it feels more dynamic that way, even though it still has that same framing mm-hmm. that a play would have. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's it's a, it's it's a fun movie to watch. Now I have a sure. question for you. Hit me. I just. I meant to look this up before the show. Totally forgot about it because I thought about it at like 6.30 this morning. Okay. And I just looked it up now. Was Aaron Sorkin a huge fan of David Mamet? Because a lot of the dialogue in this felt Sorkin-esque, especially later stage Sorkin, like the newsroom or um, the social network or... Sure. Like, uh, he just had something else that came out fairly recently that I saw. I don't remember what it was now. But like a lot of that framing like between like the dialogue of how it happened and the delivery and that hitting the marks almost yep. in a place like that, that I know that like, he's written some plays and as well as writing movies or whatever in the same way that Mambit did. But that felt that feels like it's like, now watching this and knowing some of like Sorkin's like background. I was like, Oh wow. 
I have to imagine he grew up a fan of him. I, I would assume so. I will say, like, the funny thing that you just brought up there is that Sorkin feels more like uh, screenwriting that incorporates the the dialogue and cadence of a play, whereas Mamet maybe feels a little bit more like playwriting play incorporated. Started doing movies. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like they they just started at different ends and met in the middle. But uh, I would, I, I mean, that would make sense. It wouldn't be surprising to me if, like, he considered, like, you know, if that was a, if that was a thing. Did you, did you find something on this? I didn't have, I don't have time to do a deep dive on it, but I do find it curious that, yeah, um, Sorkin's first movie came out the same year as this, and that's a few good. Mm. Hmm. That's on my list too. We should do that soon. <laughs> what, have you, you've never seen it, or no? I have it? never seen it. Really? Okay. Yeah. I saw it for the first time probably five or six years ago. Oh, um, nice. I, I've seen it a couple of times since. It really good. Movie. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I've been excited to watch that. So cool. But uh, that I'm. 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 I'm very excited for the future of Flux and the Six. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but back back to Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Can we talk about the one thing that bothers me immensely about the t- is the title of this movie? Yeah, I was a little confused by the title. Can't spell I, it. Can't be I, spelled. What? Sorry. What? It's a two words. It's one word. One word. Then two words. One word. Then two words. They're not four words. It's. And I was like, oh, and it's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and then I was like, two N's, two R's, one R, three N's. <laughs> How do I spell this thing? Well, to me, it's frustrating that it's three words. I feel like it should be two or four. Right. A hundred percent. Also, I, I never really got what Glenn Gary and Glenn Ross were. I. I always. Well, the Glenn Gary leads. Yeah, but I always assumed it was the name of the firm they worked at, and it's not. No, um, they like he, they reference them once or twice, and it's like that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't like th- those names mean nothing to me. Mitch and Murray kind of ultimately meant something, but I don't they know, were the bosses. Right? Yeah, like that's what I'm saying. But like it was like it's just uh, I don't know. If it, it, it totally doesn't matter, it was just a, a minor frustration. All right, so I'm looking something up now. Oh, actually, this is from the Ringer. Glengarry Leeds, a term used to refer to the new most substantive, 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 Jesus, I'm having <laughs> a hard time putting that together, substantive, most lucrative leads. But why? Um, is that actually a definition or is that like that, that's a just guide from, to watching the movie? That's just from them. It might be a guide to watching the movie. Uh, Glengarry is a hat. Interesting. I don't know. I don't know. I do know that yeah, they mentioned most of the time they're talking about the, they want those Glen Gary leads, the ones that are supposed to be the hot ones, right? That were yeah. that Alec Baldwin brought in, and then they maybe once I don't even think more than that, probably once it mentioned like in the past having the Glen Ross leads that they did pretty well with. So I guess they must just be some sort of like market research companies or something like that. That would be my guess, unless it was like a magazine because they did mention something about getting the leads from like magazine subscribers. I assumed that they bought a list of people who subscribed to magazines because they kept t- talking about buying lists. Oh, that could be it. Like if Glenn Gary like owned a magazine and sold a list of its subscribers. Like, could, could you imagine? Like that's what Google and all these like websites do to us now, a hundred percent of the time, for like not much money. And like back then, you had to like beat down someone's door and pay a ton of money to buy a literal physical copy. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> it's like the... A list of things that, like, they have written in on, like, old paper that maybe is carbon paper, like, somewhere sitting in, like, a filing cabinet. I think our cousin Edward sold magazines like that for a while. You might be right about that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I bought one. <laughs> or, like, had my mom buy one because I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, you were buying movies, you were buying video games, why couldn't you buy a magazine? That's true. That's true. Um, it's saying that since then, the Glenn Gary leads have become a synonym for the sales word for a list of hot prospects, but like... That's what I'm saying. I feel like that's just something that became a part of the lexicon because of this. Yeah. Um, interesting. To an actor, the Glenn Gary leads in question... This is a lot like nobody wants to explain to me where this, what the origin was. But anyway, uh, that was one thing that bothered me. Like you said, two or four words, this three business is not working for me. I don't that, like that Glenn Gary is one word, and I don't yeah, like that Glenn Ross is two. Make that's right. the same. <laughs> yeah, I want a little all or nothing situation here. But uh, anyway, that, that, that might be my least favorite part of the movie is the title. <laughs> Just jumping ahead to that section. <laughs> um, 
So we are, I mean, I guess from here on out, like, uh, uh, we've already, like, talked a little bit about specifics, but, like, there'll be spoilers going forward. It's an old movie. Honestly, the spoiling of the movie is really not even important. The story itself is actually not that strong. Uh, it's really the performances and the delivery. That's that's what is worth watching here. Yes, I believe, so, I, I, believe I called it the passion, prose, and performance of this movie. It's, it's, that's, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um but like getting into it, so like we we got to start off with talking about like the one that uh, the the scene that most people would probably associate with the movie, the Alec Baldwin scene. I was actually is, almost a little disappointed it was so early in the movie. Yeah, it's quick. It's it's early. It's he has his one long his long run, and then he's out. That's it. That's the only. I also realized after watching this movie that Boiler Room, the scene with Ben Affleck, totally rips this off. Oh really? I've never seen it. Oh. Uh, it's a solid watch, okay. um, but they. If, <laughs> after watching this, it's very obvious that Ben Affleck's like one scene was a total ripoff of Alec Baldwin's one scene in this movie, and I was like, "Oh, come on!" <laughs> I like uh, I like Silent Bob's scene in Jay and Silent Bob Rebooted. That is basically the entire thing, <laughs> word for word. <laughs> really, I don't remember that actually. Yeah, it's uh, when at the cross burning. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, well, he's just yeah. He just starts coming up with something to stall them, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He even says straight up that he's from Mitchburn. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's silly. But that that whole thing is ridiculous. I will say that watching that scene over again, um, there's he there are some lines that don't age well for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's a couple. He just he rips into these guys. And it's really, like, in some of the lines, it's, like, it's funny to watch. Like, in real life, it wouldn't be funny at all. And you would actually probably either pummel this person or you would probably give him hell back. But. Well, I just can't believe he goes through the lengths of actually bringing a set of brass balls with him. Yeah. Oh, so that that's what I want. Like, I, like wh- at what point in your career <laughs> do you get do you get to the stage where you bring that prop around for dramatic effect? <laughs> Also, I want his job. To just go yell at people? Yeah. Like to yeah. carry a, a briefcase filled with only the special leads and brass balls. And brass balls. balls. Yeah. And to give that speech to someone. Like, how many speaking engagements? Like, it can't be every day, right? Like, was it once a week, maybe? Yeah. yeah I don't know. I think. My, so, uh, do you have a favorite line from that? From that whole thing that pops into your head? No, because I think it. I don't want to say it has to be taken as a whole, but it, like, it feels like it's like. In like groupings of a sentence or three at it, a time. It, it is. I will say there was one that really stood out to me, and it's because Ed Harris gets on my nerves in this movie, and I had already remembered that from the previous time that I watched it, just because I don't like who he is as a person in the like the character. Yeah. Uh, that when he goes, I think something along the lines of Ed Harris going like, "Who the fuck are you?" and he goes, "Fuck you." That's who the fuck I am. <laughs> for whatever reason, that makes me like I laugh out loud when I see that that scene. <laughs> well, that, his specific interactions with him are entertaining because it feels like he's punching down when he's talking to the other two guys, mm-hmm. and in that one, it. Feels like not that they're peers per se, but like that Ed Harris's character can take it. Yeah, yeah. Alan Arkin's character cannot take it. That's what I'm saying. How can you and talk like, to a man that way? <laughs> well, yeah, and like, and as much as I, I loathed Levine's character, I mm. did feel bad, especially the whole thing with his daughter, like Shelley the Machine Levine. Yeah. Well, did you <laughs> notice that was my name in the in the in the Zen test? I did. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Well, it was supposed to be Shelly the Machine Levine, but it was too many characters, so I think sure. it's just the, the Machine Levine. The Machine Levine. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, it's just the whole thing with, like, like that dude goes and kills himself, right? Uh, I mean, if he like, gets an opportunity before he goes to jail, maybe. <laughs> well, like a week after this, like, he's going to kill himself, right? Seems that way. So. He's just having a bad streak, that's all. Yeah. So, like, I, yeah, I just felt bad for him when he's getting berated because, like, man, this guy is walking on, like, the knife's edge. Because this isn't a dude who could quit and go do some other job. Like, you feel right. like maybe Roma or, um, why do I not remember Ed Harris's? Um, I think I have it here. He is Dave Moss. Moss, that's right. 
like Roma and Moss feel like they could go work somewhere else. I mean, like mm-hmm. he keeps saying he's going to go across the street to yeah, whoever the fuck. I don't remember the guy's name now. Um, that he can go work there, and like that, like you know that he's selling when he's saying that. You know that he's talking it up, and he's never going to do it. Yeah, but whether he goes there or he goes somewhere else, like. Like, he'll probably take a hit, but, like, he'll still be alive, you know what I mean? hmm Like, with Levine, like, even before he goes to those lengths, like, you just feel like he can't take it, and he's about to go over the board. And that's before you even find out about the daughter. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, yeah, for sure. I will say, like, it's funny, because, like, when you're watching the movie, it's like, you're, it starts off, you're set up, you start to understand who these characters are, how they are with each other, how they are with other people, and you're like, okay, these guys are going to be, like, they're going to come across scummy for probably the remainder of the movie, right? Because they are scummy. And because they are. Uh, I'm still, Jerry's out on Alan Arkin. But <laughs> like, I feel like he's not, which is why he's not a good salesman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? So, but it gets to the point of, I think one of my favorite scenes has to be when Shelly is at the guy's house talking to him, uh, saying that he chatted with the guy's wife earlier. And eventually the guy is just like, we're not interested in buying any land. Like the answer is no. He has to basically push him out the door, right? Yeah. He's trying his damnedest to stay inside and to that keep scene it going. is probably my least favorite. It's it makes me so uncomfortable. Oh, a hundred percent. I have it under my least favorite scenes, but at the same time, it is like it's probably one of the best scenes in the movie. Yes, to some extent, but so when he delivers that line, like when he's eventually gets pushed out the door, the scene that I'm the scene in question, the part that I'm saying that is potentially one of the best scenes is the shot of the guy closing the door and the look on Shelly's face. And like that, in that moment, it's like this whole time, like I'm rooting for the guy in the house. I completely understand. I sympathize with him. This is ridiculous. Like get out of here, get away from me. Like, I don't want your land. I don't want any of this. I don't want anything to do with this. Get away from me. But you start to remember that the other character is a person too, when the door is closing and it's a very interesting shot. And I think that that's, that's a really great scene overall. It is definitely agree with you in that it makes me super uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, which, like, I guess it's supposed to, but, like, it makes me uncomfortable in more ways than just the surface of, like, oh, this guy won't give up and this guy doesn't know how to tell him nicely to go in a way that'll get him to go. Mm-hmm. But on top of that, like, man, that was a different time. Can you imagine just letting some dude off the street into your house to sell, like, yeah. that sort of thing with, like, with... With no internet to be able to corroborate that, like, this is real. Mm -hmm. It always reminds me of, there was an episode of Rugrats where that happened, where they (laughs) have an insurance salesman come in, and he scams them. And I remember at the end of that, I I literally had to, like, ask my mom. I was, like, five years old. And I was like, I don't understand. My My mom's like, oh, yeah, like, the insurance wasn't real. He just stole their money i was like wow (laughs) people can do that like like they don't get caught (laughs) regrets taught you some life lessons that's for sure yeah and like that always stuck with me i mean for one thing i was probably saw that episode three or four times as as a child so like you know i remember it but like it stuck like because i remember i was like wow like how does like that happen because even then like at a young age i'm like man like that's an important thing insurance you would probably go to like a store for that or something like that why would you Mm -hmm. just let someone Come in and sell it to you. Yeah, it's yeah. It, even it's though, like, I, like I'm not even joking. Like when I was like a kid, I remember being so confused. Like, why would someone come to your house that you don't to sell you something important? Like, right. I didn't know the nitty gritty details of what insurance was, but I knew it was important. Mm-hmm. And, like, <laughs> why was that a thing? Why could someone just come to your yeah. house and That's sell you an investment or insurance? Door salesman. Yeah. Well, there's a big difference between here, I'm going to sell you this vacuum, and here, I'm going to sell you insurance. Is there? Yes. <laughs> For one thing, hundreds or thousands of dollars. For two, when the the guy walks out, the vacuum is in your house with you. You yeah. can see it. You can touch it. You can yeah. use it. It might be cheap. You may have paid too much money for it. Sure. But it's a vacuum. It's a good salesman. Sold you nothing. That's what I'm saying. Like When that guy walks into your house... You might not have a thing. It was a simpler time, Al. It was easier to pull the wool over your ass. I know. It's terrifying to me. It makes me very uncomfortable now. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) 
That's, that's it's terrible. <laughs> but uh, the in that scene when he's going, um, he's like, I have to go pick my wife up from work. He's like, Ah, oh, yeah, talk to the lady. Can't wait to meet her. We'll take my car and uh, we'll pick her. <laughs> right. And he's like, No, no, like we gotta go. We're that having was dinner with a pretty good. That was we're pretty having, good Hail Mary. Yeah, we're having dinner, you know, with her parents. Oh, Phil, she didn't mention anything about that. And he's like, I don't see why she would. <laughs> And he goes, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to see what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to the office. I'm going to pull another drawing. And look at me in the act of giving out a prize. <laughs> I will give, you know, get a plot of land for your, for her parents, too. And he's like, we don't want to buy any land. We don't want to invest in any land. Please get out of my house. And then Matthew brought her a cable guy. Get out of my house. <laughs> uh, it's, so it's, it's rough. But uh, on the topic of the machine feed. His greatest shtick is talking to his assistant, Grace. <laughs> Grace, pull me 10,000 petty cash. <laughs> well, that was good. But actually, my favorite like quirk of the character was his ability to switch gears. Oh, yeah. Like, he went from sob story to towering rage to please help me to hey, we're best friends in yep. like four seconds. In a sentence. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was dizzy. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> that, like, but that's like that's kind of the beauty of it, right? That's the whole purpose is the disorientation of like you don't know where to land afterwards. Yeah, it's horrifying too. But it's mm-hmm. like I was like, how is it even possible? Yeah. Oh man. Spe- like same on the same topic of that. Like uh, 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 what's his face? Um, Roma's character does that. Like really well like in all and by doing what he does is he peppers in these ridiculously long things that he says that mean nothing and like the facts are like are pseudo in there but he completely like he glosses over things he turns it around he switches gears like he does his double talking and like it's there's crazy a of, there's a lot of pseudoscience like essentially in what he's saying there's a lot of double talk mm-hmm. there's a lot of like it's one of those specific moves of like liars where it's there's so many obscure random details that don't need to be shared. Right. Where it's just like, I'm going to pepper you with a barrage of things and let's see if you can call the bullshit on them. Exactly. You can't because I've just hit you with 4,000 words. Yep. Oh, man. He he nails that. Uh, honestly, the best scene where he does that in, which is another one, my least favorite and also probably one of the best scenes, is when he's talking to Jonathan Price about uh, the canceling the check. And it's three business days. And it's like, so like, so we'll talk Monday. He's like, Monday won't work. It's three business days. Like, yeah, three business days. That had, that, uh, had, not, that, had, that had big Tim Curry and Clue energy. Yeah, not Saturday and Sunday. I'm not counting Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, because it's just the three business days. So we'll talk Monday. But if today's Tuesday, what did I say? <laughs> he goes, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. When did you give me the check? Today. Or it's like so it hasn't been cashed today. So the early when is the earliest that check could have been cashed? Wednesday. So we so that's three days. <laughs> it's like y- yes, and he he's getting the guy like riled up because he's he's just he's gonna keep going until the guy quits. Yeah, well, because that whole time all I could hear in my mind was one plus one plus two plus one's not one plus two plus one plus one. Right. Oh, a hundred percent. Exactly. <laughs> but that, that scene, that irritates me though, because the way that he does it, it's like, he's doing that thing. Like, I, I, I don't remember the, um, the mechanics of it, but there is a, there's a change scam that people used to try to do. And they used to do it at the pizzeria and attempt to do it all the time. And I would just point to the register that said the cash back that they were supposed to get for the amount of money. It was like, it's right here. You're not right. But like, there's like a change thing that you do where you count on your fingers and you, it's like a, you give a 24 something and you count up, but you kind of, the way that you orient it, you add a dollar. They basically end up plus a dollar at the end, but it's like, I'm pretty sure that was a gag in Scooby-Doo, but they, they, cartoons today. Yeah, yeah. They try. They used to try to do that. At the, I'm not even kidding you. Like these people would try to do that at the pizzeria. I'm be like, I was like, you're like, you could. That's fine. I've already put it in, <laughs> and I <laughs> and the change is displaying on the screen to you. Those damn calculators, yeah. And computers. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so that's like, sir. So it's like, sir. I'm currently in a calculus class in high school. Like, you're not gonna beat or, me with like fast math, <laughs> right? But uh. Anyway, like that's like it seems like like that's the type of thing that I feel like he's doing. Like that's like that type of talk. It's almost like a three. He's like he's basically three card Monty the salesman. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> you know what's great too is during all of those things when he does the puppy dog face. Mm. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. But you know, uh, but you, but that 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 wouldn't leave us time to, to on Monday. What? Like you know, he just yeah. is a super innocent face. Like, no, because we're best <laughs> friends. Yes. Yeah. It's, well, they shared it's, a very intimate evening the day before. It's dirty. Yeah, an intimate evening where I wrote a quote down where he says, "You ever take a dump that makes you feel like you just slept for twelve hours?" And I was like, "What is this line?" <laughs> it was like a total non sequitur, too. Like, <laughs> it wasn't even like it had nothing to do with what they said right before or right after that. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't even a transition in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Like, he didn't even come straight from the bathroom, did he? No, I think he like got up to get a drink. He, like he got he up from the, the table. Yeah, oh, that was that was her day. But I I heard the line and I was like I was focused at this point watching it. I was like, wait, what? And I I rewound I rewound it just so that I could write it down. <laughs> well, I was like, there was like a very listen. I know we were dancing around the homophobic slurs earlier when we were talking yeah. about Alec Baldwin's speech, but like there was some. Tension, some energy between the two of those characters. Yeah. It was a little weird. And, like, not in the sense, like, it's like, oh, like, that's weird that, like, two guys might have been intimate in any way, shape, or form. Just in the sense of, like, in no way, shape, or form, at any point did they give any sort of hint that these two characters might be gay. He keeps talking about his wife. He's just trying to sell him. And it's, like, to the point where it's like, oh, God, how far is he willing to go to sell him? Yeah. That was the vibe I was (coughs) catching, where it's like, we're not just doing the thing like we're buddies now. It's like it was almost like conspiratorial, like affair type stuff. Yeah, it was. It, it definitely it, it got you got some of those vibes from their interactions for sure. Like, I'm I will like, say, man, how low are you willing to go? Yeah, it, one of the things that he does that's fascinating, uh, Al Pacino's character, is that he he's the one he's the fast talker right he's the one that says a lot of stuff that is unrelated he says a lot of things that don't mean anything that don't string together they're thoughts they're like random thoughts you, you, call, you call them three card monty the salesman i'm gonna call him non sequitur the person uh, yeah <laughs> yeah uh al non sequitur pacino uh but uh he he so he does that but he gives just enough in there that's like it maybe sound like there was like a deal in there or like some really great opportunity. Like that's what he does. Right. And he, when he's presenting the Jonathan price, he's like opening up this brochure and he's saying like these weird things. And he's like, I don't know. It's just a thing. It's here. What happens? Who knows? And like, you know, like he's, he's doing that. But that's what I was getting about with the intimacy thing, because I've seen like disgusting <clears throat> pickup artists yeah. who behave that way with the same exact type of cadence. Mm hmm. And I'm like, ew. Yeah. Like, why has this become that sort of intimacy? Like, if someone was trying to sell me something and that was how they're going, I'm getting up and walking away. Sure. Guy, girl, doesn't matter. Like, no. Yeah. If but you're I, trying to sell me this so hard, there is no way this works out. For well, there was something. There was something in there where, like, uh, Jonathan Price is already drunk, and they were drinking a lot more. Where he sure. was trying to get it. It was a long point. But yes, like, I... Uh, spent all day with the guy. They were drinking. They yeah. had a good time. But they're cozied up in this booth. Yeah, it was weird. There was... The- whispering, like, conspiratorially, like... It's our... The gap, they, they pretty much have their arms around each other at one point. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. weird. They start opening the pamphlet, like, yeah. suggestively. And I'm like, mm-hmm. what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. It's We're very, talking it's about a shitty investment. Yeah. Like, if you're trying to fuck them, good luck. Yeah. But, like, we're selling an investment. <laughs> you know what was my favorite part about that? Is when he opens the brochure. There's nothing in the brochure. It it's is a picture. It's of, a it picture was, of grass. <laughs> was it a, sorry, am I misremembering this? Was it a picture of grass and, like, cranes or something? Or flamingos? Something like that, yeah. I think like, flamingos. Look at the Fuck. Yeah, I this so, it so it wasn't ridiculous. Even like houses. It wasn't even like it was like maybe it could be a golf course. Like it's it's just grass and flamingo. Yeah. A tree? Yeah, that was that was ridiculous. So now um, amid all of this, there is um Alan Arkin and Ed Harris are are they're 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 talking about potentially they're 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 talk they're just talking about it. they're not talking about it, but they're talking about robbing <laughs> uh robbing the leads. And I think they, there's a there's a, there's another thing where uh, 
Ed Harris, Dave Moss. He's, again, not the salesman. He's just trying to get one over. He will use everybody and everything in this path to do it. Uh, in this case, the probably the most pure-hearted character that we have, the Alan Arkin George, <laughs> um, where he's he's swindling him into ro- taking the, into robbing the business and taking the leads, which I think this this setup, this setup and twist is actually really great and really well executed in the movie. Of Ed Harris is like messing with him. He's like, he's like, yeah, we can sell him for this much, this much each, yeah, this much each, and like they they double talk each other a few times there. And uh, because Ed Harris is selling this whole op, this whole opportunity to Alan Arkin, and um, it turns into what was it? It's like twenty five hundred dollars or twenty five thousand. I don't remember. What it was. I think it's twenty five hundred. Twenty five hundred. Twenty five hundred dollars. And uh, he uh, he's like, which you're by, gonna. Which, by the way, man, they got to be desperate because that's not much of a price for what they're mm-hmm. gonna do. Well, well, that was the thing. That's where it gets really nasty, right? Where he goes, 2500 He's like, and you got to go in and talk to the cops. So like, why do I have to go in? And he's like, well, they like, I have an alibi. You're not going to have, like, whatever. And he goes, he's like, and if I go in there, you know, it's not going to be good. He's like, and who's going to give me my 7500 And he goes, 7500 And he goes, I thought it was 2500 He goes, $2,500 is your getting. Don't worry about my side. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you know what? Still, though, $10,000. Like, what? They're going to retire on $10,000? Right. What what is that going to cover you guys for the next couple of months? Yeah, it's it's gnarly, but that whole thing goes back and forth, and he gets he's like, well, he's like, you have to do it. He's like, well, he's like, so we're going to go in and take the leads. He's like, you're going to go take them. Me? He's like, well, and he, he like basically does this whole like double talking. I set you up kind of thing. I've made you an accomplice after the fact or before the fact, whatever it was that he said. Uh, he he's a trickery. It's 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 all garbage. It doesn't mean anything. But he he gets Alan Arkin scared. Which is why when you get further on in the movie and the leads are taken and he's super nervous, you think it's because Ed Harris basically forced him to go take him. But it makes even more sense when you find out that he decided not to do it. He's even more nervous because Ed Harris made him afraid that he's an accomplice to the robbery. Well, yeah, it's great because, like, it happened. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's just... Like, it actually happened, but he didn't do that. But you don't know that he didn't do that. Yeah. At least not yet. And not yet. And then uh, when he's talking to uh, Roman, he's like, what do I tell them when they call me in? He goes, tell them the truth. It's the easiest thing to remember. And you're like, that's like great advice. Or like, he can't do that. He stole the leads. Like, that's that's how the audience feels at that moment. <laughs> and it's like, but no, he didn't. He could go tell the truth. But it was, uh, he was afraid that he it was an accomplice, even though he wasn't even a part of it at that point. Well, he's probably afraid. That Ed Harris is going to get caught, and he's just going to be like, "Well, he he like he did it, like or he's yeah. going to like plant it in his desk because he thinks the heat's too high." Like, right, right. Uh, that that whole thing is is so it's so messed up. I think uh, so. That's them messing going back and forth. Another great scene is when uh, Al Pacino rips into Kevin Spacey. <laughs> they all they all get a, a good shot. At yeah, him. but well, he's for Alan Arkin, but that's true. But uh, the way that he does it is like it's super intense in that scene, and he just like he just boils them down like it's it's ridiculous. And then what I love about that is uh, Kevin Spacey's character like he actually feels he seems to feel bad about what he did. Like he missed he missed it right. He didn't get like for a little bit in 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 uh, um in how he kind of messed potentially messed up Al Pacino's sale, but. When Levine starts ripping into him, he's still like, he's like, yes, I get it. I screwed up. But then he like when he when he starts to get the edge and realize that Levine took the leads when he switches it, it's it's gold. Like the although, way that although Levine really unravels really too easily. Oh, yeah. Because what he he's a hot said, mess, though, what he said, really. But like at that moment, he's in the driver's seat. He's the one who's browbeating Kevin Spacey. Yeah. And when he says, like, how did you know I didn't send it? Like, it didn't take anything on him to say, well, of course you didn't send it. No one expected you to fucking do that the last thing last night. You know what I mean? Like, he could have deflected it any which way. Well, that was the thing. So, Or, th- or you wouldn't be acting like this if you sent it. You know what I mean? Like, he, I think what happened in that scene was they followed, he followed his own, uh, Levine follows his own advice. Uh, he follows Al Pacino's advice, whose name keeps... Ricky Roma, right? Yeah. 
Uh, Levine follows Roman's advice. It's his own advice. It's like the salesman advice. It's like you don't open your mouth until you know the shot was the thing that was said just before that. And when Kevin Spacey says, how did you know I made it up? Levine doesn't know exactly what's going on. And he keeps asking, what are you talking about? Like he's, he's stalling. He doesn't know the shot and he won't say anything yet. I think that the way that they revealed that rule of the game just before making it that he has to stall, I thought was a really well done execution of that whole thing. Well, it did feel like, like I think you were right at the beginning where you said, well, he's a hot mess. Like he's running on empty. He's like a ball of nerves at this point. Yeah. Because of the stuff with his daughter and the, the cash or the, the check not clearing and, you know, his sale not being real, right? Mm-hmm. And and all of that stuff that maybe he had just run his race and he didn't have any more left. Yeah. But even in all of that, he could have played that. When he says, what are you talking about? He goes, how'd you know I made it up? What are you talking about? He still says it. He says, how'd you know I didn't send it? All he has to say is, well, you've been out here, you know, doing, like, he could have blustered his way through. Now, the suspicion still would have been on him. Sure. But there's still no evidence to tie him to it, per se. Now, yeah, I think, I think it was just too hot, right? The, the heat was too close, and he was also, it was the end of a really long series of events for him where he doesn't have the, he's he's basically not on his A game, which is, like, sure. just the perfect time to knock him down. Yeah, I was just like, man, like, he's really, like, short circuited in that moment. <laughs> yeah. But then he the him trying to recover though, that's that's kind of the scene that you're talking about earlier. When he tries to recover from that and he goes from like sad to best friend to like make you a deal to like it, he bounces around so quickly in that scene. And yeah. I think the most powerful moment is the upper hand moment that uh uh Williamson gives Kevin Spacey is when he just when he puts the piece of gum in his mouth, there is that like it's like, I I won. Like, this conversation's over. <laughs> and he put the piece of, and it's like, you're really going to turn me in? It's like, why are you going to do that? Because I don't like you. <laughs> was a, Which was, a, was pretty thin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, there was any host of reasons he could have chosen there. <laughs> yep. But maybe that's the most disrespectful. Will you go to lunch? Will you? Will you go? <laughs> go to lunch. <laughs> oh, man. It's too much. Let's see what else we got here. You have any other notes? Um, well, I just have it's kind of more just like an amusing like observation. Like we already talked about the Ben Affleck like scene ripping off the Alec Baldwin scene. Um, do you remember? It might have been the act, the final actual skit in the series. Do you remember we watched with Bob and Dave on Netflix with Bob Odenkirk and David Cross? Yeah. Do you remember the salesman sketch? Not like, not with just that, I don't. Okay, so it kind of, I I realized well, after watching this movie that, like, because there's been a million movies, TV shows, whatever, that does some version of this, right? Yeah. Like, you know, both before and after this movie, like the, you know, the, the struggles of the salesman and all that. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's always longing for a better time that was before that usually wasn't as good as we make it out to be and all that jazz. Right. Um, so they did, I realized that some of the specificity of this that in the, the this whole sketch because the Arkin character reminded me a lot of the Bob Odenkirk character in that and the Spacey character kind of amalgamated with the Baldwin character is the David Cross character and they like this new guy on like the sales force and they're like no one has sold anything in forever they're gonna we gotta really hit the payment oh we're out there day and night day and night you know twenty four hours a day but none of them has sold anything in like years right. <laughs> The whole thing ends up being like, I don't, the, it's not a big deal to like spoil the sketch. The the twist at the end of the sketch was they're trying to sell Korans, and the yeah you, okay I remember the, this like like they get to he's like oh we can't do this house we can't do that house well blah, blah. you know they get to the door and he goes yeah he rings the doorbell well we tried and he tries to leave and like the young guys like just hang on a second they didn't yeah the woman answers the door and yeah. oh yeah yeah my my husband actually um like has like. He's like a, a pre, like a preacher or like a an imam or whatever. One of these things we'd love to buy your. <laughs> your <career>. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's so. Funny. But I realized the whole thing was like parodying this movie specifically, not just the trope of all that salesman stuff during the course of it. Um, that that movie 
or sorry, that sketch I found to be really entertaining, especially like so frustrating. And they do the same thing, like that patter of the the back and forth and the, you know, oh my God, you know, this and that. And, you know, we, we don't need leads. Like that sort of thing, like was very well like mir- mirrored and all that. The leads thing I found fascinating, both from like, just like the historical perspective we were talking about. Like, can you imagine like buying that from like some right. company? Who, but also their like they worshiped these leads, you know what I mean? Like it, it was both blessing and curse to them. Yeah. And it was, you know, well, we can't do it because we don't have good enough leads. Oh, but we had those great leads at one time. We did, we made a killing. And it's like, oh man, it felt like the leads were even kind of a metaphor for something. And I don't even know what per se, but. Well, it was, yeah, it was basically just like, I don't know. It reminded me of every other, it's every single person that I know that everything is somebody else's fault. Like it's like, like, but at the same well, time, it, yes. yeah. At the same time, like, yeah, it seems like they were, they were in a shitty situation selling shitty things in a shitty job. Like I, they're not wrong, but they yes. take zero responsibility for not doing well. Yes. But like, I don't know why I, I guess I'd have to think about it some more, but the leads for some reason felt it feels like it's supposed to be representative of something else, and I don't know if maybe magic beans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was just kind of supposed to be like a utopic, like idyllic, like the perfect thing. Like everyone's looking for that silver bullet, mm-hmm. and like or like they're always looking for grass is greener because they always find the new leads, and then those leads weren't good enough. They need the next leads, and there's the shiny new toy, and like. Maybe it's just the whole idea of like greed and wanting what you can't have. Is yeah, what it was what I'm kind of getting at. I don't know because whenever they have something, it's not good enough. They need the next thing, and then yeah. those things don't pan out. And then, well, what's the next like mm-hmm. lead? Like, I, it just, uh. just and overall, the overall they all seem very unhappy and unfulfilled, and they keep chasing this the next thing that's supposed to make them feel better. It's like almost like a drug. Well, I was really confused too, like early on, like talking about like not like having the situation they want and all that. Why they all had to make calls at the payphone when they had their own phones? Because the way it was set up early, I was like, oh man, they're in such a shitty office that they don't even have their own phone and bathroom. Now, admittedly, they maybe didn't have their own bathroom, but they did have their own phones until they get stolen. Yeah, I think I was wondering if maybe it had something to do with some form of callback, whether you call the operator to connect you to the previous line or something like that, and they couldn't be reached if they weren't at the office. Maybe. I also wonder, it might have been because they didn't, because they lied a lot during their sales, like about yeah. where they were based out of and who they were selling to and all that. If it was allowing them a certain amount of anonymity where they couldn't be tracked back to where they actually worked. It could be. It's probably it is probably something along those lines, especially when they were just like I'm the vice president of so and so. Every time they're calling from a cell phone, uh, from a payphone, which that's not uncommon. Cause you saw something like that in like Wolf of Wall Street, right? Like, weren't they all VPs? Yeah, like 100%. on the phone, weren't they all VPs? Yeah, they're, like in the beginning when they're in the boiler room. Yeah, I also like when they was like, oh, he's like they're like, don't worry about that other contract. Uh, Mitch and Mer- Mitch is going to go out. Uh, he's going to be the he's going to be the president of the company who's just in for the day. <laughs> <laughs> like they say it so casually that it's like, yeah. oh my god, that's horrible. <laughs> but oh man, it's a it's an it's an entertaining watch for sure. Yes, you know there in some ways, I felt a certain kinship between this and Uncut Gems, right? Where it's like the constant selling, the scumminess, the yeah, like the persona, like just uh, uh, like they wear this persona mm-hmm. and it becomes them, right? But I found this to be much more gripping. Maybe it was because there was more characters. I think that's probably what it is. Uncut Gems would be like one of these characters and taking a deep dive, going home with them, going out with them, seeing their relationships with other people. Whereas this was just like in the office. Also, like they basically were all detestable, right? But they yeah. all were, they all felt more human than the lead in Uncut Gems. I don't remember the character's name. Obviously, it was Adam Sandler. Sure. Um, I think ultimately that was a failing of that movie. Mm. There was nothing redeemable about that character. Yeah. You know what was a failing of that movie? It was that movie. Well, a lot of it. But you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Levine had the thing with the daughter. You know, Arkin is like, you know, okay, he he's he, not it, really cut out for this. Like, he doesn't seem like a bad person. He just feels like he's caught up in this shitty job. Yeah, I agree. Even, even Moss, it's like, 
okay, yeah, he is kind of hurting people, but like he's not doing it maliciously. Hmm. Like, and Roma, we don't get enough time with to actually fully hate him the same way we do the other ones. Yeah. Um, and even then, uh, maybe, and I guess to the performance and the writing, even when you do see it nakedly, he almost sells you a little bit. And like yeah. Williamson's just trying to do his job. Yeah. I mean, he's like a, he's a dick. There's no yeah, question sure. about it. But he catches so much crap from these guys and from his bosses. I think there's a, there's a bit of all of us who can see ourselves in that where it's mm. like, man, I'm just trying to do my job and I'm yeah. catching it from both ends here. Like, what the fuck, guys? You yeah. just go do your job. You leave me alone and just let me run this place. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> and will you go to lunch? <laughs> and will you go to lunch? Uh, they, uh, you- one thing when you when you were breaking those characters down that I thought could have been interesting is the uh, for Shelley's character, the machine, Levine. Mm-hmm. If he, uh, they, I wish they would have played into it a little bit more, where you're never quite certain if his daughter's sick. That would have been, I feel like, just a little extra icing on that character. So you think he was scamming? No, 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 no. he wasn't. They made it very clear that he wasn't. I oh, think so that you it wish could that have they been introduced the doubt. I, w- I I think that introducing it a little bit, like just just so that you have the question of like, man, I really just can't say for sure because of how he plays people. Well, that would have made his whole shtick like scummier and more compelling from that perspective. But, but in the in the way that he's written, it becomes Boy Who Cried Wolf. Yes. So I found it more compelling from the human aspect of man, I want to hate you, but also yeah, yeah. like you've painted yourself into a corner and like that should be on you to deal with, but someone right. else is going to pay because of what you are. Someone who has nothing to do with this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Oh, this is definitely, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an entertaining flick for sure. You got, you have anything else on this? No, I don't think so. I, I thought you were looking up something though. Um, no, I don't think so. I was scrolling through my notes, but I'm pretty sure that we, uh, we touched everything. Um, Oh, the only the only other thing that I have in here that we didn't mention was um, there's a couple of tactics that are like tried and true. It seems like that they employ like they, they each employ at some point or another during the movie. And like you'll hear today, like you'll get it on a call if you or if you've ever been on like a uh, what do you call those things? Like a timeshare uh, uh where they parade you around the place, I, I don't know, uh, a tour, a timeshare tour, yeah, yeah. right? Where they like they they'll do like there's this phrase of like, listen to me. Are you listening? Listen to what I'm going to tell you. Like, like to really like try to, to, to pull you in. And they mm-hmm. all do that. They all say that phrase in some fashion or another throughout the movie. I just thought it was interesting. That's like, that's a, like the research went into this. Yeah. You know, which I no, it does a, feel authentic. I mean, yeah. And maybe it's just cause we weren't alive. Well, I mean, I guess we were alive when we weren't like cognizant in that time. Mm hmm. And, like, it feels like it has to be different now. Like, like, that has to be very much a hallmark of 1992 and before then. Yeah. But, uh, like, how did that even exist a thing? Mm-hmm. Like, who bought those investments? Right. Like, even even the timeshare thing, obviously, has proven to be a scam. Largely. But while you may not be getting your money's worth, there is something there again like you know talking about like the vacuums that like in the end of the yeah, day, yeah. You get a vacuum the other day you can go on vacation there yeah like this feels so thin mm-hmm. like it's not even like someone pitching you stocks like you know what i mean it's like the land might not even exist right it's in it's somewhere in florida yeah like uh, like how is that a thing but like it's still even though that feels like it's pushing the boundaries and, and maybe i'm like Talking about ass, maybe it was like a real thing that happened. Like it, it probably was, but like mm-hmm. it still feels too surreal to be like a a real thing. Like, but it yeah. still was so the attention to it, like detail and all that, like felt very authentic. Yeah, like, yeah. they could have been spelling, they could have been selling fucking plots on Mars, uh-huh. and it still would have felt authentic. Yeah, listen to me, listen to me, listen close, listen close to what I have to tell you. Um. um. Anyway, that's all for this week's episode of Flicks in the Six. We hope you enjoyed it. As always, if you have a movie for us to review or nuggets for us to discuss, you can send those requests to Flicks in the Six at thespintune.com or tweet us at thespintune. Tune in next week for more movie and beer goodness. Until then, I'm Anthony Costanzo. I'm Al Bielsi. Thanks for coming out.
Will you go to lunch? <laughs> Will you? Will you? <laughs>